Hello and welcome one and all. It is an honor to introduce the three-day international conference, Cosmopolitan Culture and Oceanic Thought, Thinking Through History Across the Waters, organized by the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia, in collaboration with Center for Indian Studies in Africa, University of Witwatersrand, supported by the Scheme for Promotion of Academic and Research Collaboration, Ministry of Education, Government of India. What can be a better way to start a conference on shared histories and cosmopolitan culture than a poem? This is an anonymous poem in a British Guyana newspaper, 1893. O coolie girls with eyes of wonder, with thoughtful brow and lips compressed, I know not where your thoughts to wander, I know not where your heart doth rest. Is it far away by rolling in dust? or down by Ganges' sacred wave, or where the lonesome Indian Ocean, the shores of Malabar, doth lay. Ah, no, those lands you never saw, this Western world can claim your birth. Your parents thence their life may draw, their thoughts of joy, the themes of mirth. This land of mud has been your home. It was here you drew your natal breath, your home of childhood, doomed to be, the land shall hold your dust at death. Then why so foreign, why so strange, in looks and manner, style and dress, religion too, and social ways, this mystery I cannot guess. The poem highlights what W.E.B. Du Bois terms as a double consciousness and a sense of alienation of the children of Indian indentured laborers who were taken to Guyana. There are many themes and issues explored in the poem that are the subject matter of discussion in the three-day international conference. It is our privilege to welcome the chief guest for the three-day international conference, Professor Najma Akhtar, Honorable Vice-Chancellor of Jamia Millia Islamia. We would now like Professor Nisha, Nisha Zaidi, Head of the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia, and the conference chair to give the welcome address. Thank you, Stephen. I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am, you are. Yes, you are. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Najma Akhtar, Professor Dilip Menon, Professor Isabel Hoffmeyer, Professor Lakshmi Subramaniam, Dr. Fahad Bishara, Dr. Nidhi Mahajan, and so many other distinguished scholars from across the world, colleagues and participants, and dear students. Greetings to all of you. I'm delighted to welcome you to this three-day conference that we at the Department of English have organized in collaboration with the Center for Indian Studies in Africa, University of Witwatersrand. This conference in which eminent scholars and young researchers from across the world are participating is a part of our collaborative project funded by the Ministry of Education, Government of India under its unique scheme called SPARC or Scheme for Promotion of Academic and Research Collaboration. Our project began in 2019. The aim of the project is to chart transoceanic flows of people, ideas, and material as an alternative way of understanding experiences, spaces, and identity. Under this project so far, we have had two seminar courses offered by Dr. Sara Jeppy and Professor Dilip Menon in August and November 2019, respectively, at the Department of English. Dr. J.P. Scores titled Thinking with the Sea, Histories of the Indian Ocean, explored the Indian Ocean world from the early modern times until the mid 20th century as a way to chart new histories of the global south to understand how littoral geographies, islandness, and the ocean itself have shaped understandings and experiences of the past. The seminar course offered by Professor Dilip Menon titled Oceans as Method delved into the question of methodology and helped students and researchers develop an insight into the conceptual framework required to develop an understanding of a paradigm of thinking history with the oceans. Together, these two seminar courses encouraged our students and researchers, which included uh, researchers not just from Jamia Millia Islamia, but also from all major universities across India, to begin to think about alternative frameworks 
and methods for their own research. Friends, this collaborative conference is taking place in a year when Jamia Milia Islamia, the lusty child of Gandhian non-cooperation movement, as Jawaharlal Nehru termed it, is celebrating its centenary year along with the 150 years of Mahatma Gandhi. And this indeed has added to our pleasure. In contrast to the clerical model of universities established under the patronage of colonial regime that aimed at serving the administrative needs of the empire, the founding fathers of Jamia Milia Islamia wanted Jamia to act as a cradle of critical thinking. And true to their dreams, these hundred years have been a glorious journey of forbearance, camaraderie, enlightenment, and an unflinching commitment to the ideals of plural nationhood and composite culture. It has been a tough journey indeed, but withstanding the financial, political, and social challenges, braving all assaults on its existence, our university has upheld the ideals of peace and truth. Today, Jamia is counted among the top universities in India. Its artists, writers, poets, and scholars have consistently contributed to the intellectual life of the nation. The Jamia campus bears the signs of its progressive ethos and its intellectual commitment with gates, buildings, gardens, and even benches bearing names like Puratula and Hadar, Noam Chomsky, Edward Said, Ravindranath Tagore, Mir Anis, among others. Like many other distinguished departments and centers of the university, the Department of English, which came into existence fairly late in 1970s, has made its own mark in a very short period. Its contribution, especially in the area of translation across Indian languages is widely recognized. We therefore are delighted to host this conference, which foregrounds affiliations, intersectionalities, affinities, and cosmopolitan thinking. I extend a very warm welcome to all of you once again to this three day of churning of the ocean of ideas. And with these words, I would like to invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor Najma Akhtar to deliver the inaugural address. Professor Akhtar is an Indian academic and administrator and educationist, an institution builder, but most importantly, she's a wonderful human being. Her enthusiasm and support for all the activities that we engage in has inspired us to keep going even in the blinkest of times. I welcome you, Professor Akhtar. Thank you for taking out time. Uh, over to you, ma'am, for your inaugural address. Thank you, Nishat for giving me this opportunity. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Perfectly audible. Okay. okay. Uh, Professor Dilip Menon, Mellon Chair of Indian Studies and Director, Center for Indian Studies in Af Africa, University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. Professor Nishad Zaidi, Head Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia, Professor Simi Malotra from the Department of English, Jamia Milia, participants, guests, students, from ladies and gentlemen, uh, researchers from major Indian universities as informed by Nishat from India as well as abroad. So, uh, and I, I welcome all of you to this and wish you a very good morning and welcome you to, uh, to this program and to Jamia and to India. To those who are outside India, you're welcome to be part of India for some these three days. Uh, I am thankful that Nishat has already uh, informed you about the uh, history of Jamia. It is a very unique thing. And when you are talking about history across the waters, thinking about through history across the waters, we must also know how this, this institution has developed through 100, day, 100 years of development and uh, becoming a very unique institution where we are sitting with a lot of pride and acceptance by the world and by the Indian education system as being one of the, uh, one of the best universities in the country. 
I uh, I'm happy that this program has been held now in spite because COVID has not been able to uh, drive us to depression or to stop us from working. None of my university departments have stopped working. And in and the Department of English is definitely not easy to be uh, left behind. And therefore, uh, I'm happy that such a program is being held involving a lot of international uh, intellectuals as well as national and the research scholars because it's important for everybody. Friends, cosmopolitan cultures and in oceanic thought, thinking through history across water, a very interesting uh, topic. It is an international conference that marks the academic exchange between Jamia Vilya, Islamia, New Delhi, and the University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. Therefore, we are honored and delighted to host the first MHRD-sponsored Spark International Conference in Humanities and Social Sciences in our university. This conference is an outcome of the Spark project under the aegis of MHRD, that is Ministry of Human Resource Development, which gave an international platform for exchange of ideas and knowledge between the two universities. A learning experience as a result of workshops conducted, conducted by Professor Dilip Menon and Dr. Sara Jappi has been very enriching for our students, as well as for me, because I was there in one of the workshops, again to inaugurate and did not stay after that, but I, I was witnessing these workshops early also. We are proud to have various national and international academicians and scholars for this conference, as it has brought agencies across the world for a vibrant and intensive exchange of views, knowledge, and experiences. And I am happy that both these universities have been able to collect the right people here and also those who are interested in knowing about this topic. Well, coming together is also important because whatever we do should be known to the world. Throughout history, the oceans of the world have been essential for exchange of goods, people, ideas, and religion. As a result of which, the maritime routes have been made, have made it possible for huge cultural transformations through trade and travel. Ideas have historically been spread much more easily through sea than through land. The ocean therefore is a site of migration. It is also a space of transition and transformation. This conference engages with mobility, with circulation and with cosmopolitanism in the Indian Ocean space while engaging with traditions of reflection and intellection in the in global south to think ab ab about an alternative history of concepts for the social sciences. The Indian Ocean in the world history is unique because it has been a point of inter intersection for three con continents of the old world thus developing a fluvial maritime frontier. Therefore, exchange of ideas today is going to be very interesting. I again extend a warm welcome to all the delegates and participants, participants representing their corpus of research. Sparks efforts to bring together these delegates from different countries is commendable. And conference is an occasion to discuss issues of mutual interest and concerns at a wider level. I wish all of you were in India with us for these three days. We would have really welcomed you in Jamia. However, 
due to several limitations, the next best alternative was having this discourse online. And I wish the chief speakers and the participants all the very best and a successful three-day international conference and interaction. Thank you and good luck for the next three days. Thank you, Professor Najma Akhtar, for your humble words. We would like to introduce Professor Dilip Menon. He is the Conference International Chair and he is the Millen Chair in Indian Studies and Director of Center for Indian Studies in Africa, University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. He will be introducing the theme for the conference. Uh, Dilip, unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Yes. Am I audible? Okay, great. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is one of the uh, formalities of the Zoom conference you're getting used to that uh, you have to constantly ask whether one is audible. But uh, colleagues and friends, uh, uh, thank you all of you for being here. And some of you have taken the extraordinary effort of being awake at one in the morning so as to be able to address the conference and it's one of the uh, troubles and indeed the pleasures of organizing a conference across so many time zones and across the entire world in some sense, united by the ocean, of course. So what I will do here is to uh, think, speak about three themes that uh, I think underlie the conference and uh, represent also the culmination of what we've been doing in the collaboration with Jamia over the last uh, two years. So the first theme I'd like to take up is this question of space and time. And one of the things that thinking with the ocean has allowed us to do is to think beyond the national, think beyond the regional, and think indeed beyond the international, where at the heart of it lies the myopia of the historical time of the nation state, which as we know is a fairly recent invention. The other theme is that of moving beyond the terrestrial imagination, which underlies the writing of our history, where we are bound to the cartography of countries, cartography of continents, and so on, where the sea is forgotten. And indeed, when we think about an earlier history of empire, empires are made possible through the movement of these Western powers across the ocean to uh, spaces like Asia and Africa and so on. And recently, Shujit Sivasundram's book, uh, Waves Across the Global South, uh, tells us also or reminds us about the forgetfulness of the sea that underlies a lot of imperial historiography. So in that sense, this, is, uh, this conference is about remembering, remembering the oceans that connect us. And speaking of connections, again, one of the, uh, probably the, the myopia that undergirds a historical imagination is that we tend to divide oceans into the Atlantic, the Pacific, Indian, and so on, each with their own histories, so the history of the Indian Ocean comes to be associated with indenture, that of the Atlantic Ocean with slavery. But these are continuous oceans. This is a continuous body of water, which human beings have arbitrarily divided and named. And so in that sense, when we think about a recent work that has come up, uh, which was the basis for the course uh, titled Oceans of Method last year, Anisa Mavani's book on Komagata Maru, uh, which talks about Baba Gurdit Singh and his attempts to carry Indians across to Canada from uh, uh, South Asia. And one of the thing, uh, principles underlying Baba Gurdit Singh's idea of the Guru Nanak Steamship Navigation Company was that human beings should be allowed to travel across all the oceans. There should be no imperial restriction, nor indeed a bounding of national imaginations. And there was a plangent phrase where he said that the ocean does not belong to anyone's father, right? This was an strongly anti-imperial cry that underlay the formation of the Guru Nanak Steamship Navigation Company. The other thing that this allows us to do is to think beyond uh, the narrow triad, which you used to think with of the pre-colonial, the colonial, and the post-colonial, where at the heart of our imagination is the colonial, as if our, the spaces that we occupy have been defined entirely in their history by the idea of the colonial, which is actually the abbreviated time. I mean, it is about a few uh, hundred years in the histories of uh, our spaces, which have been connected over millennia in some sense. So this uh, conference and indeed the teaching that went 
into the conference was also trying to think with the idea of the para-colonial, the idea that there are times beside the colonial, times that exceed the colonial, and that we need to think about a proliferation of time just as much as we need to think about a proliferation of space. The second theme is that of the of lives. And again, if you had to truly think about a subaltern history of movement, Amitav Ghosh's Ibis trilogy has uh, allowed us to engage with the imagination of lives lived in and with the water, where the ocean is not a horizon of thought, the ocean is continuous with the uh, terrestrial lives, and that we have to think about the world as a composite of land and water rather than uh, dividing the world into land and water, having historians who work on land, historians who work on the sea, and so on and so forth. And uh, the most profound reminder of this has been, uh, the, I think, what is the most important metaphor of the 21st century, where we live in a time where we live with the imagination of the rising of the waters, global warming, the Arctic, Arctic melt, uh, ice caps melting, that in the end, we are all, regardless of where we are, just as COVID has reminded us, regardless of where we are, we are bound by a human condition that extends across the globe. And the metaphor, the most dominant metaphor of the 21st century has indeed been the Syrians who walked across the water to Europe people who had never engaged with the sea, who took to the sea in order to escape lives that were being fragmented by war and by international politics. And so when we think even if you go back a few thousand years and you think about the original movement of people out of Africa, if you have to ask ourselves the question, how did people end up in Australia? It can't be that we restrict ourselves to a history of uh, the land routes through which humans travel in order to get from Africa to Europe, Asia, and so on and so forth. This is something that Maria Rosodoska talks about in her book, Vast Expanses. But how do we think about civilization expanding from the literal spaces rather than from the riverine spaces? And that's a larger question that we could think about. And again, when we think about lives, we are reminded that many of our histories or much of our history is bounded by uh, terrestrial imaginations, bounded by landed imaginations, which also means that we leave out the histories not only of labor, right, of the subaltern histories of movement, we leave out the history of commerce, of mercantile groups, that they have been, India has been connected through the ocean with spaces like China, sp spaces like Africa, and so on. And what we see now as a contemporary history is indeed a deep past, which we need to be thinking about. And not so long ago in the 16th century, silver from Mexico united the world across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe, creating a price revolution and through Philippines to China and India. So again, speaking about a continuous waters, that silver as a commodity united the world, created a crisis in the Mughal Empire as much as the uh, landed empires in Europe. Finally, uh, when we think about what are the kinds of narratives that we can generate through these histories of space and time, bringing together the histories of lives, I think we can arrive at a truer idea of a cosmopolitanism that is generated by this movement of people, material, commodities, ideas, and so on, and the evolution of polyglot, creolized cultures, about which we shall hear a lot, that indenture and slavery in some sense created a miscegenation of people, of ideas, and of cultures. And this requires us to engage with what the great Caribbean poet and thinker Edouard Glissant called archipelagic thinking, that we need to think about non-contiguous spaces, spaces which are not next to each other, which are connected through imagination, through affinity, and through travel. And this archipelagic imagination is what allows us to think oceanically rather than terrestrially. And the more recent works which have looked at the movements of Indian Ocean Islam, for example, or the Arab cosmopolis which unite uh, Southeast Asia, Asia, and the Middle East through the movement of scholars, through the movement of religion, literary texts. Uh, we're thinking about the movements that create multiple forms of resonant architecture across the ocean, forms of clothing, forms of music and dance, again, which we shall hear about uh, in the course of our seminar, where we have to think history differently. And since I'm coming up to the end of my 10 minutes, uh, I'll leave you with another metaphor. 
if you think with the metaphor, if you did think with the metaphor of the Syrians walking across the ocean, let's go back a few thousand years. And at the time of Aristotle in the fourth century of before the Christian era, Greece, as we know, we tend to think about Greece as a country, right? As a terrestrial country, Greece was not a single political entity, but a collection of around 1,500 police or cities which were connected by water through the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And Plato in his Phaedus said, we live like frogs around a pond and we have settled down upon the shores of the sea. So what we need to do is now to embark, get our feet wet, get our minds wet. And I hope this conference will allow us to think about what an oceanic imagination does in order to reshape the ways in which we think our social science and humanities so thank you all for attending and thank you, Nishat, thank you, Vice Chancellor, and thank you, Stephen and Grace, the uh, student coordinators who actually undergird the conference, who've been responsible for a lot of the hard work that has allowed us to put this together. Uh, so over to you, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for that accelerating introduction. Now we would like Professor Simi Malhotra, Professor at the Department of English, Jamia Millia Islamia, and Conference Co-Chair to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, am I audible? The, the compulsory question for Zoom. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank yes, you. you uh, so, I mean, it's such a, such a privilege and such an honor to actually have the opportunity of thanking people who've actually made uh, this conference possible. First and foremost uh, is the Vice Chancellor, Professor Najma Akhtar. Uh, as you've seen and heard uh, yourself this morning, that she's the one who's been leading us to uh, to not sit, sit pretty uh, in these challenging times and to keep working hard as she herself does uh, and keeps inspiring us to keep working hard uh, and has been raising the profile of the university so well. So thank you so much, ma'am, not only for taking out time this morning to be with us, uh, uh, this morning for the inaugural of the session, but also for constantly being our support and, and an inspiration for us to, uh, to uh, carry on with the work that the Department of English has been doing under your uh, patronage. So thank you so much, ma'am, for being with us. Uh, I'm also uh, very thankful to the administration of Jamia, who's, who in spite of these challenging times has been supporting us constantly in helping us organizing, putting together this particular conference. Uh, most importantly, I also want to thank all the uh, all the invited speakers, the keynote speakers and the plenary speakers who so readily and so generously agreed to share their ideas and their time uh, and across time zones uh, and to be with us uh, today. And so we're really, really grateful uh, to, to all of you for, for being so generous with yourself, with your ideas, with your thought and with your scholarship. And we really look forward to, your, uh, to hearing you all. Uh, we are also very, very grateful to all the paper presenters. We had an overwhelming response. It was very hard to choose the papers that we have finally selected, but I'm sure it's going to be an intellectual treat for all of us to hear uh, these paper speakers. Uh, we are thankful also to the chairs uh, who have agreed to, to lead these discussions, as also to the rapporteurs. Uh, we are very, very grateful to the organizing team. And when I think of the organizing team, I think of two uh, pillars, so to say, Stephen and Grace, uh, and of course, all the staff uh, who's there. And of course, to the to the great, great friendship that we forged with uh, University of Witwatersrand, the intellectual inputs that we've had from Dilip and from Sarah, and of course, for the collaboration that we've had with them. So thank you so much for that. And of course, to the leadership that Nishat herself kind of embodies. Uh, so I thank all of you, and I thank all of you for all the other participants and colleagues who have taken out time to be with us this morning. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, these three days are going to be an intellectual treat for all of us. Uh, and we're really looking forward to, to, to the sessions that are to follow the inaugural. So thank you all once again. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you all the uh, people who are part of this particular inaugural session. And we shall be meeting for the, for the sessions after this, uh, this inaugural is over. Thank you. All. Thank you so much for, to everyone for joining the inaugural session. Now we will be moving towards our first session where the moderators are Professor Dilip Menon, Professor Nishad Zedi and Professor Simi Malhotra. And the key speakers in this session are Isabel Hofmeyer, Lakshmi Subramanian and Fahad Bishara. So shall I introduce Isabel? 
Yes, sir. Who, who's here, I'm presuming, already? Yes, yes. Okay, um, uh, so good morning again. And uh, I, I realize that all of us are going through this rather breathlessly because uh, we're not aware of uh, how to uh, do this time so that you can finish on time. But it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Isabel Hoffmeyer, who is not only a wonderful historian and reader of literature, but also my colleague. And the very reason indeed that I'm here in South Africa, because it was 10 years ago that uh, Isabel began her work on uh, the Indian Ocean, thinking oceanically, uh, trying to bring together narratives around history and literature, and indeed the, the entire aesthetic dimension. And now her work over 10 years has progressed to a point where we are at the cusp of her departure from the ways in which we think about oceanic studies, and that is indeed what her lecture is about. Uh, Isabel is the professor of uh, African literature at the University of Whit 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 Witwatersrand. She's also the global distinguished uh, professor at New York University. But these titles do not exactly encompass the range of uh, Isabel's uh, work as indeed the uh, genius of her conception of how social science and humanities ought to be done. And uh, in a diverse range of essays, Isabel is one of the most productive academics I know, in a diverse range of essays which deal with questions of uh, the visual imagination, questions of the textual imagination, questions of geography, questions of how one is to think fluvially about the world. And indeed uh, her work on Gandhi, which allowed us to look at Gandhi very differently from a space in South Africa thinking about Gandhi's printing press, alerting us to not only uh, his presence as an international uh, thinker, but as to how Gandhi read, how Gandhi used words, allowing us to pause and reflect on what it is to have a Gandhian practice of living. And in this lecture, uh, Isabel is bringing together perhaps uh, over 10 years of work in thinking about the idea of hydrocoloniality where, as we know, a lot of what I have said and a lot of our, the ways in which you've thought about the ocean have been histories on the ocean. And Isabel has now uh, left us far behind and uh, allowed us to move into another dimension by asking the question, what is it to think history in the ocean? Right? And uh, if this sounds very intriguing to you, over to Isabel to tell us more about hydrocoloniality. Thank you, Isabel, for joining us. Okay. Um, okay, good morning, everyone, and my warmest thanks to the organizers for the invitation to be here. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this wonderful event, and also particularly to be on a panel with my very old friend and colleague, Lakshmi Subramaniam, and also with Fahad Bishara, um, whose work, of whose work I'm a great admirer. Okay, so let me get to the, to the business. So, the talk I'm going to give you today is taken from a book that I've just completed entitled Hydrocolonialism, Coast, Custom House, and Dockside Reading. Now, the core of the book itself is a case study of the colonial custom house, which oversaw censorship and copyright, which are obviously issues of interest to literary scholars. So as you can imagine, much printed matter came from outside the colony had to pass through the port city, and it was the colonial officials who then checked this material to see whether it was pirated, seditious, or obscene. Okay, so this case study then is framed, the framing of this case study is this concept of hydro-colonialism, and that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, in my presentation. Okay, so let me start with some definitions. The term is a, ne a neologism, which I've sort of made up, um, and it obviously riffs off the term post-colonialism, and like that concept has a wide potential remit, which could include colonization by way of water, you know, various forms of maritime imperialism, colonization of water, occupation of land with water resources, declaration of territorial waters, militarization and geopoliticization of the oceans. It could be a colony on or in water. The ship is a miniature colony or possibly the penal island. Colonization through water, you know, flooding of occupied land, 
um, and the colonization of the idea of water itself. So how water becomes to be produced as a sort of neutral and secular substance. Now, you, you, you may of course ask, uh, want to ask, do we really need this term hydrocolonialism? It has long been appreciated that water is centrally implicated in imperial and other social orders. Water sculpts political authority, whether in the ancient hydraulic empires of Central Asia, the water dynasties of South India, the rain-making chiefs, chieftaincies of Southern Africa, or the modernist hydrological projects of the colonial and post-colonial world. So, you know, geographers and anthropologists have thickened understandings of water as an quote-unquote informed material, uh, you know, implicated in hydro-nationalism, struggles around citizenship, um, settler hydrologies and hydrocosmologies. So the classic hydrological cycle of evaporation, condensation, rainfall and runoff has been widened to become the hydrosocial cycle. Um, and this configuration tracks how H2O becomes the social substance water shaped as much by capital as by contours. So Dilip de Kuna and Anuradha Matur have freed the hydrological cycle from fictions, from the fiction of neatly divided land and water. And working in a monsoon context, they demonstrate, quote, an ecosystem that is neither land nor water, but one of ubiquitous wetness in which rain is held in so soil, aquifers, glaciers, snow fields, building materials, agricultural fields, air, and plants and animals. Okay, so while this, this, these, this very rich body of works are crucial to understanding the sociologies of water, they do not specifically address literary concerns. So modeling itself on post-colonial theory with its cultural remit, hydrocolonialism explores the literary implications opened up by overlaying the hydrological cycle onto imperial and post-imperial cartographies. So this move, as you can see, requires us to think laterally, vertically, and contrapuntally between different water worlds and hydro imaginaries while exploring how such circuits have been or may be narrativized. There's now a really exciting repertoire of scholarship exploring these themes like critical oceanic studies, coastal and hydrocritical approaches, elemental and atmospheric methods, and a, a bit more on that later. And together, I think these fields have established water as a method for doing post-colonial literary criticism. So this is, it's too extensive to, to discuss exhaustively here. So I'll sketch three pertinent trends across these various fields, which for the sake of convenience, I dub high, middle, and low. Okay, so in the first trend, mega or scale meteorological patterns like monsoons or cyclones or hurricanes offer ways of defining literary regions and generic structures. So most obvious in this regard is the monsoon zone of the Indian Ocean world. And, um, you know, and I'll, I'll just skip over that because we, you know, it's very familiar to everybody here. Um, and just, of course, in, in that, the, the, the theme then of the cyclone uh, is very important. And the architecture of these formations, like the spiral or the eye, are used biomimetically to illuminate the tree structures. In a, in a long tradition of Carib Caribbean eco-poetics, the spiral of the hurricane informs a Haitian literary movement of the 1960s known as spiralism. So uh, 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 Kayama, sorry, Kayami Glover, who's written on this, says on a formal literary level, the spirals perfectly balanced uh, maintenance of the centrifugal and centripetal offers a neat allegory of the tension between insular boundedness and global intention. Because I said then, you know, these various you know, bodies of work allow us to read literary texts as imaginative interventions into the hydrosocial cycle itself. So rather, I think like African ritual specialist rainmakers who intercede via the ancestors in the hydrological cycle, literary texts intervene in our understanding of the water cycle and its narrative possibilities. So Sarah Nuttall has extended this point in her analysis of what she calls pluvial time, examining 
uh, quote, rainfall in and as climate crisis and what temporal logics and narrative forms this is producing. Okay. So just going on then to our next middle, middle level, we arrive at the coast, okay, the site of human evolution itself, and hence one of the most enduring and productive artistic terrains. So post-colonial literary critics have, very, have variously analyzed the littoral as an ecotone, a place of, quote, fractal multiplicity and amphibiousness, uh, which writers use to complicate orthodoxies of all sorts. So as Meg Samuelson indicates, quote, littoral literature and coastal form muddle the inside outside binary that delineates nations and continents, and which has been particularly stark in framing Africa in both imperial and nativist thought. So coastal morphology and its associated water formations or waterside chronotopes to borrow Margaret Cohen's term, um, you know, uh, thinking of things like lagoon, estuary, delta, shoal, white water, brown water, these constant, we can think about these as constituting micro, uh, sort of micro literary regions, sorry, literary micro regions. So as climate change increasingly buffets coastlines, these regions like the, you know, the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta, the Lagos Lagoon, or the Bombay Archipelago become more prominent, producing narratives of coastal life and its perilous uh, uh, terraqueous futures. So going now below the waterline, the categories of oceanography, which designate the different layers of the ocean, you know, epipelagic, mesopelagic, abyssopelagic, halopelagic, are being deployed by literary scholars as engagement with the sea becomes more material and concrete. Stacey Alimo and Joshua Bennett have both deployed the idea of violet, violet black, which is the dominant color spectrum of the abyssopelagic zone, you know, in quite interesting ways. So the, Im the imagination in Derek Walcott's very famous poem, The Sea is History, is largely epipelagic since the formations and objects in the water are, are assumed to be visible. So given that his home island, St. Lucia, perches on a volcanic shelf, this is perhaps to be expected. So other strands of Caribbean aesthetics, such as works by M. Norbezi Philip or M. A. Césaire, invoke deeper formations, the volcanic, the tectonic, the basin, and so on, directing our attention deeper. Sean Lavery has developed these ideas in relation to the Indian Ocean, exploring the layers of the vertical ocean in cultural and literary terms. So one important dimension of post-colonial theory has been the imperative to move away from colony metropole binaries okay, and to trace multi-directional empire-wide interactions. Modern colonialism explores these considerations contrapuntally in relation to water. As Sarah Pritchard's work on French hydrology demonstrates, Hydraulic expertise built up by French engineers in French North, uh, North Africa was imported back home to France and used to improve the techniques of quote unquote backward provincial farmers. So in literary terms, I think one, one could take an empire wide view of moral and social hydrology that saw surplus populations as stagnant sources of contamination needing to be channeled, drained or carried away. So themes of drainage, hydrology, and flow dynamics could be read contrapuntally across empire, focusing on themes like tidal circulation and great expectations, and cross-hatching these with Namwali Serpel's recent novel, The Old Drift, which draws together settler hydrologies and hydrocosmologies on the Zambezi. Okay, so just together, you can see these techniques add water, depth, and verticality extending land-focused and horizontal purviews. In a post-colonial context where land has been overdetermined and the sea over-erased, such relativizing me methods become especially pertinent. Land is favored both as an automatic platform of knowledge and as a locus of the colonial and anti-colonial nation. The ocean, by contrast, has been forgotten, first by emerging settler uh, colonial nations attempting to erase its origins, and then by anti-colonial nationalism, turning its back on the ocean as a source of imperialism. So in a post-national uh, age, the rich and creolized meanings 
of the ocean, both pre-colonial and colonially, are starting to be more system systematically employed. Okay, just the, the work that I've spoken about thus far is mainly related to um, thinking about literary critical uh, practices. Um, and my particular, in this book, I'm really interested in questions of print culture uh, and book history. So there's a section then of what does a hydro-colonial approach mean for thinking about print culture? So a hydro-colonial approach makes visible the mutually shaping relationship between print culture and the elemental politics of the colonial maritime frontier. So it enables us, I think, to configure printed matter, the colony and the ocean in ways that establish a more dynamic relationship amongst these three terms. So this triad of print, ocean and colony has certainly been explored and there's a, you know, a rich research on printed matter and maritime circulation. But this work has however largely proceeded in a dry register with the sea simply as a backdrop. So hydrocolonialism takes a different tack, putting water and paper closer together, immersing printed matter in the elemental politics of the colonial port city. So this burgeoning field of elemental media studies provides a useful framework for this uh, uh, purpose. So as Nicole as Storo Sielski indicates, all media becomes environmental media and all media studies becomes environmental media studies. So as John Durham Peters suggests, the elements themselves have be, uh, uh, need to be understood as quote, infrastructures of being and agencies of order. Okay, so when, when applied to print culture on the dock side, a hydro-colonial method highlights printed matter as part of port infrastructure, you know, both in terms of the manuals and forms that officials on the dock side use, and also um, in, in relation to one of the things I'm interested in was settler handbooks, you know, which told settlers which routes to follow, how to get there, what to expect on arrival, and often including the arrival forms as appendices. So these volumes, as you can see, acted in concert with the port infrastructure, okay, and it's land, you know, which depends a lot on land reclamation and submarine engineering, you know, because ports are these often these very sort of, you know, uh, invented or artificial ground. Um, and of course, this, uh, these, these infrastructures quite literally reached out to incoming passengers of the right class and race, giving them their first purchase on the colony. And in the same way, the print culture, the settler handbooks reach out, uh, you know, to uh, settlers as a And uh, so we can think about these settler handbooks as a mode of textual land reclamation. Um, or it's a kind of, we can think about them as a kind of land full, extending literary infrastructure outward to enable the immigrant to arrive, extending a platform of advice and preparation to would-be settlers, inventing land for them before they had arrived. Okay. So just sort of moving uh, towards the final part of the paper, uh, there are two themes arising out of this work um, that are important in this book, and that is the theme of co colonized water. How is water colonized? And then creolized water. And I'll speak briefly about those two. So central to hydrocolonial thinking is how water comes to be colonized. Okay? So Siobhan Carroll's work on elements and empire is instructive in this regard, showing how air, water, and ice initially appeared sort of uncolonizable and empire proof, largely because they're not, they, they could not be settled or occupied. In the longer run, these elements were indeed rendered colonizable, whether as sites of performing imperial masculinity, as resources to be extracted, as dumping ground for wastes, or as methods of defining or redefining international law and geopolitics. The long-term effectiveness of these strategies is apparent today if we turn to the ocean, which from its seabed through the water column to its surface has been prospected, militarized, mined, and laid claim to. And as Elizabeth de Lugri has recently pointed out, 
um, she indicates a hydro criticism for the 21st century needs to engage, engage less with, quote, with the concepts of fluidity, flow, roots, and mobility than with less poetic terms uh, such as blue water navies, mobile offshore bases, high sea exclusion zones, uh, sea lanes of communication, you know, the slops, and maritime choke points. So in the Southern African case, coastal waters around port cities were colonized through a sort of aquatic territorialism by which land was extended into the sea, either literally through reclamation and submarine infrastructure, or by the, by the extension of land-based methods of governance over the ocean, you know, promulgation of sovereignty, port regulations pertaining to the intertidal zone, declarations of quarantine stations uh, around uh, ships. So port cities contrived then possession of water and sediment as much as of dry land. As an antidote to the shipwreck, port engineering becomes a central narrative of colonial possession and a founding mythology of port cities themselves. The, har the harbor engineer becomes a minor imperial figure, a tireless soldier who takes on the Sisyphean battle against sand. Yet the prominence of these narratives is short-lived as colonial possession moves inland and the sea recedes into the distance. Dredging, after all, is not easily mythologized. So the submarine imperialism, I think, is only starting to find really a kind of conceptual vocabulary. Ben Mendelssohn's work on Lagos offers an instructive example, which demonstrates how, quote, sand and related coastal geomorphological processes interact with the city's political and imaginative trajectories, as well as its historical legacies. So a focus then on submarine engineering engages uh, with a vibrant body of critical oceanic studies that shifts away from older surface oriented approaches and engages with the materiality of the sea by going below the waterline. One strand in the scholarship relativizes land-based epistemologies via the ocean. Terming these dry technologies, this work immerses concepts and theories in order to produce new modes of analysis, whether uh, based on actual diving experiences, analytical immersion, thinking with you know, um, marine species or submarine aesthetics, this work traces how and by what media and genres and with what effects the unseen ocean is mediated to human audiences. So whether speculative fiction, underwater photography, aquariums, Rococo decoration, shipwrecks, coral reefs, or conceptual poetry, critics adumbrate how these forms mediate the undersea and how they deal with the representational problems of scale, depth, and visibility. Okay, and then just the, if finally onto this, um, the idea of creolized water. Port cities are intense nodes of cosmopolitan exchange. These historiographies have, however, largely kept their eyes on land or on the surface of the water. Okay. Um, and so hydrocolonialism attempts to shift that, uh, shift our view offshore and underwater. This perspective, I think, builds on work that I've done elsewhere on Durban, uh, while also drawing on an emerging method which uses the harbour floor as a site to explore port city histories from a submarine perspective. So my particular investigation speculated on what kinds of remains might have accumulated in the decoction of Durban Harbor and its hinter sea. So in addition to shipwrecks, you know, collapsed infrastructure, detritus dumped by ships and, you know, and port workers, the odd book also tossed into the ocean by customs officials, uh, there would also have been traces that speak to the cosmopolit cosmopolitanism of the port city. These would have included the paraphernalia of Hindu Muslim religious festivals that were immersed in the ocean. These remnants in turn remind us of the variety of oceanic imaginaries to be found in any port cities. In the case of Durban, these would have included maritime mythologies uh, from South Asian groups, from Zulu speakers, from African dock workers from further afield, as well as port officials drawn from across the world. Speculating on and from the Durban Harbour floor redefines water itself as cosmopolitan or creolized, containing both the material and imaginative remains of different communities around the port city. 
So while true for any body of water, such creolization would be especially uh, pertinent in imperial and post-imperial settings. So Southern African waters, for example, are especially creolized, being the imagined domain of African ancestors, Khoisan, you know, roughly First Nations, water spirits and deities, Muslim water jinns associated with enslaved communities brought under the Dutch to the Cape, as well as imperial ideals of maritime manliness. So the concept, I think, of creolized water can usefully be put into conversation with black hydro poetics and the Middle Passage. Ancestral and aquafuturist, um, to use Susanna Chan's term, you know, riffing on Afrofuturism, a body of creative and scholarly explorations exper experiment with the Atlantic undersea as a realm of speculative diasporic histories. Notable example includes Ellen Gallagher's mixed media explorations of the Black Atlantic submarine, the meditations of Christina Sharp on the molecular remains of enslaved bodies and their residence time, uh, the electronic music of Drexia and the underwater realm it imagines where the children of drowned captives have um, uh, adapted to submarine living. Together, these constitute black hydropoetics as a major focus of diasporic scholarship and constitute the undersea as a potent source of ancestral memory and imagination. So putting black hydropoetics in relation to Southern African creolized water opens up suggestive submarine cartographies. These might map how Southern African oceanic ancestral tra traditions relate to the drowned communities of both the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, the arena, as I said, from which Cape sla uh, enslaved peoples were, were drawn. So once one considers this enlarged realm, the dramatis persona expand, taking in the jinns and genies of the Indian Ocean, the ancestors of the African Ocean, the submerged deities, uh, of Indian indentured communities and the drowned of both the Middle Passage and the Indian Ocean. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, for that absolutely extraordinary uh, lecture, which has opened up the conference to uh, realms far beyond uh, its original conception. And living as we do in at a time when we're all discussing the Anthropocene and the earlier ideas from the Bible of the flood that was over and it's a fire next time. We live with the idea that it will be the flood next time that might be taking our lives. Uh, so it reminds us that we need to think with the water seriously and that we need to be less K and Chaudhary studying the ocean and more Jacques Cousteau going underwater and trying to figure out the times and the spaces and the lives of the ocean and I think what Isabel has done uh, very briefly is uh, while she began by saying we need to think beyond post-colonialism, what she's done is actually think beyond existing social theory in many senses, reminding us that we need to have a vertical cosmology that helps bring back nature, bring back the heavens into our understanding of the earth. So we are thinking about the rain, we are thinking about meteorology, we are always thinking less with the hubris of an Anthropocene that sees human actions as destroying the universe and thinking really about the limits on human action of nature, of things like cyclones, hurricanes, and so on, which uh, uh, do away with the plans, the well-laid plans of mice and men. Secondly, I think she's also asked us to think inwards from the ocean into the land rather than thinking outwards from the land as we've been uh, uh, habituated to doing, and reminding us again that we need to think with much larger conceptions of time, of geological time, of meteorological time, so that when we think about the present, we don't think with the myopia and the abbreviated time of things like colonialism and uh, nation building and so on, but we have to think with much larger swathes of time. So thank you, Isabel, for that absolutely brilliant talk and a great uh, beginning to our uh, conference. We have around uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions, and uh, I'll ask the student coordinators to handle this end of it, uh, because uh, I'm not sure how to go through this. So over yes, to... Yes, sir. The, yeah. The, the rapporteurs will ask the question. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm muting myself. Hello, ma'am. A wonderful lecture, ma'am. Thank you so much for this. There is a question for you from Amartya Agarwal here. The question is, when you see literature immersed in oceans, 
do you mean books drowned in oceans or literature dealing with life around water? Okay, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, it, 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 the, the, the idea of Im immersion operates on me in many different ways. So if you're interested in this, there's a fabulous scholar called Melody Jew, spelled J-U-E, who's just produced a book called Wild Blue Media. And she's very interested in, you know, how does one get away, from, how does one, you know, uh, get away from this sort of land-based, very Cartesian way of thinking. Um, and she's, if you're interested in this, she's written a completely fantastic article called Submerging Kittler. So she takes Kittler's media theory and then tries to think about, you know, what would happen if you, um, thought about it much more at sea, under the sea, you know, so, so that's the one kind of sort of conceptual immersion. She also, and there are several scholars who are also divers, so then they use that experience, you know, in which the, uh, any sort of kind of Cartesian epistemology is completely gone. So, you know, that's another, a, another way of thinking about it. Then, as I say, there is a lot of work on how is this invisible undersea mediated to us. So, you know, there's wonderful work on coral reefs. If you're interested, there's a really, um, there's a uh, collection of essays edited by Margaret Cohen and Killian Quigley, uh, which is on undersea aesthetics. And Killian Quigley's work is really interesting. He takes Rococo decoration and looks and just does incredibly interesting conceptual things with it, you know, by looking at the sort of seashells, you know, and the marine sort of traces in that. Um, I'm particularly interested in another dimension is, and what are the books that get thrown into the water and what can you do with that? Um, you know, so there are books that get thrown into the water for censorship purposes. So the customs officials that I look at, um, Sometimes if they deem a book to be unsect uh, uh, unacceptable, they can burn it or they can throw it into the water. So it's a sort of elemental translation of this book. Um, so, uh, you know, and then there's also often a very set piece of somebody starting a new life. So there's a fabulous piece in Langston Hughes's autobiography. He sails out of New York Harbor. He's going off to a different life. And he throws a whole lot of books, uh, you know, representing his previous very unhappy year of studying science at Columbia uh, and hurls them into New York Harbor. Um, but some, uh, somebody who works on Langston used to tell me that he did keep his Walt Whitman. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it's all, so, so that, you know, and, and all of that scholarship is unpacking all of those levels and thinking of many more levels and really fascinating. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, there's a comment and a question from Anna, Professor Anupama Mohan. She has written that, thank you, Isabel, for a really thought-provoking lecture. I thought the distinction between cosmopolitanism and creolized is significant. Uh, the former still has positive connotations while the latter can be descriptive of a range of interactions without necessarily converting historical processes into a moral praxis for scholarship. Any further thoughts on the distinction between the two notions in terms of hydrocolonial approaches? Okay, thank, th thank you. Yeah, um, you know, and I suppose that it's like sort of any ter terminology that one uses, you know, it's, it's kind of got limits and possibilities. So, um, the, in terms just of, <coughs> um, the, I, I, I've, I suppose I could have spoken about cosmopolitan waters, uh, but I was much more interested, I think, in sort of creolized waters, uh, both because of the sort of range of interactions that it implies, and also because creolization often implies, uh, you know, structural conditions of violence, um, uh, it, it, where, where sort of cultural interaction that's, you know, it's, that's the background under which things happen. So I'm sort of interested in that. And I'm particularly interested then also in material ways, also in which um, these, these practices and oceanic imaginaries 
uh, are affected by the colonization of water. So once you have port cities, once you have land reclamation, once you have racially segregated beaches, you know, that means in practical terms, it's difficult for people to get access to particular kinds of waters. So for um, in terms of African ancestral belief, ancestors inhabit what is called living water. Um, you know, so it's got to be kind of moving water. And so increasing these, you know, certain areas, ancestral domains become cut off. Um, you know, and then what does that mean for how uh, those sorts of things are, are, are remembered? So I suppose I'm just using that to try and think, uh, to, you know, to, as, as one of the ways then to think about, you know, these are not just all of these um, oceanic imaginaries happily melding together, you know, it's also in this context of structural violence. Um, apologies, uh, there is a five, a, sorry, yes, sir. five more minutes for questions. Uh, All right. And, so, uh, there is a question from Professor Lakshmi Subramanian. Uh, um, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Sure. Um, can can you hear me? Because my yes, connection. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, can. Okay, um, Isabel, thanks. That was a terrific lecture, and you populated the idea of uh, hydrocolonialism so effectively. And I can see the way it works for literary analysis. I've always been trying to grapple with how to translate these things into a methodology for a discipline like history. Um, you know, so how does one actually develop? an interdisciplinary methodology that can also respond to the historical imperative. This is something that I am constantly challenged by, uh, particularly when we look at oceans. I mean, waters are also bounded. So where does the water end and the land begin? Uh, custom houses are very much oceanic spaces, but they can also be equally strongly terrestrial spaces. So how does one actually translate this wonderful imaginative categorization into an actual method? It's something that I'm grappling with. So any pointers, but that was just terrific. Great, thank you. Um, yes, I, I mean, I think this is why it's such a fascinating field because it's kind of, you know, it's just opening up. So that's the, the really interesting challenge is how to do that. If I can just talk a little bit about what I'm sort of trying to do. So I'm trying to think very much about all of the, and what, what can you do analytically with the various sort of submarine spaces? You know, so I mentioned this whole thing of the harbor floor. There's a very interesting project, in fact, on this um, Sydney harbor floor. So using the harbor floor, as a kind of site and method for re th rethinking the history of the port city. Um, I think there's huge interesting because all of those, all of that stuff that was built, uh, you know, what does that mean for ideas of labor itself? Um, uh, you know, there's just is always this, it's implicitly, you know, that there's the maritime labor that's on, on a ship or there's a maritime or there's land labor. Um, so, so that sort of thing. I, I think the whole, I'm very interested about how does one think, for example, how do you start thinking about submarine engineering? And I mean, from your wonderful work on port cities and Madras, um, you know, you must have thought, thought you know, and, 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 and in fact, you've written about this as well. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about. Then, I mean, there's fantastic stuff on, um, uh, uh, you know, the sea as a sort of juris, the, 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 the sea as a legal form, you know, Renisa Mawani. I recently came across uh, the Professor Ranganathan's work from um, Cambridge on decolonization and uh, uh, laws of the ocean, which is just completely fascinating, you know. Um, there's very interesting, I heard a fabulous paper by um, Shaman Chua on Bandung, and one of the themes of that people discussed there was um, freight rates on ships. You know, so, so that's also, I think, another whole way, rather than thinking just about those, those 
uh, those kinds of transnational movements in terms of old dry technologies with just a sort of social movement, you know, with the ocean in the background. Much more, what did they say about the ocean? I mean, I was just like really fascinated to, through Professor Ranganathan's work, um, that the, uh, what's it, the UNCLOS, the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea, uh, which sort of took shape between 1973 and 1982. Uh, it was signed by the ANC, uh, the PAC and SWAPO. You know, so that itself is a completely fascinating um, node to think about. You know, in South Africa, the absolutely, in, for those erstwhile liberation movements and still today, the big thing in public discourse is the land question. And then what is now, you know, what is the sea question, you know, that these liberation movements actually thought about that. So, so yeah, so I just think it's, it's a, you know, those are just some things that are throwing out, but it's just such a fabulous and interesting field. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Isabel. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to keep to time. I mean, I, I myself have a hundred questions I want to ask you, but I think we'll probably go for coffee and do that uh, in our own city. But thank you for that extraordinary lecture and thank you for kicking off uh, a brilliant series of uh, thoughts which will uh, frame the conference. Now over to the next speaker who will indeed be Lakshmi Subramaniam. So I'll leave it to Stephen to do the uh, in-between coordination as it were. Thank you, Isabel. Right. Uh, Professor Simi Malhotra will be introducing Professor Lakshmi Subramaniam. Such a pleasure, Lakshmi. Welcome, Lakshmi. I mean, it's such a pleasure uh, to welcome you to the conference uh, and such a pleasure for me to introduce actually Lakshmi to everybody. I mean, nobody really needs to be introduced to Lakshmi. I mean, but for this, uh, for the for those who are new to Jamia, you'd be so you you probably would know or would not know that uh, Lakshmi is not just someone who was associated with Jamia as a professor of history uh, for some bit, but she was actually the one who initiated. Uh, or who's actually the kernel through which this association, not just on Indian Ocean Studies or interest in Indian Ocean Studies started, but also our link with the uh, University of Witwatersrand started. So actually, in some ways, uh, uh, this conference is a, is a tribute uh, to, uh, to Lakshmi uh, and what Lakshmi has actually brought intellectually to us. But that's just saying too little about Lakshmi because uh, uh, obviously anybody who has known Lakshmi knows how, how, how much of a brilliant uh, and how much of a vibrant uh, scholar she is. Uh, just to give you some coordinates about her, of course, currently she's at Bitspilani and also uh, she is um, an associate fellow at the University of Advanced Studies at Nan. Uh, but before that, I mean, much of her work and much of her very, very important work, which with many of us are familiar with, uh, has come from CSSS Kolkata, where she has been for a long time. Uh, but like I said, that she's been associated with other universities like Vishwa Bharti and Calcutta. But most importantly for, for us uh, at Jamia, we, we, I mean, it was our loss that she went back to Calcutta. Uh, and of course, she's had a number of visiting professorships and, and stints at Wettingen and Warsaw and an Institute of Women. One can't really do justice to her uh, travels everywhere. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I think for, from our perspective and from what we uh, know, uh, for much of uh, what we consider Indian Ocean Studies in India, I think a lot of uh, credit for uh, for initiating and also carrying on uh, tirelessly this work on Indian Ocean Studies and maritime history uh, can be said uh, to have been done by Lakshmi uh, really uh, in some ways. Not only has she been looking at uh, trade and social networks in the Indian Ocean uh, and maritime history, uh, but also, I mean, very importantly, and that's a part of work which we cannot ignore, especially in the light of the recent work which has come out of hers this very year uh, on, uh, on Gandhi uh, and, uh, and sonic nationalism, uh, is her work on, on social history of music and performative arts in modern South India. Uh, and so, of course, uh, uh, that's a very, very important work. I mean, so, I mean, I really can't do justice and name all the books that Lakshmi has written, but I mean, some of the very important works for anybody, and, and I know there are lots of researchers who are here, so I must name at least some few works which you must consult if you already haven't, uh, or on uh, the theme uh, of the Sovereign and the Pirates ordering a maritime subjects in the Western uh, lit a Literal, which was 2016, The Merchants of Bombay, uh, Port Towns and Cities, A Historical Tour of the Indian Literal, 
Um, now, of course, the medieval seafarers, uh, and of course, uh, for those who are interested in our, in our other scholarship, and radio scholarship is huge, uh, which is on music, uh, her very important work on New Mansions for Music, uh, which is on performance, pedagogy, and criticism, and her, her, and her 2020. So, I mean, COVID has certainly not been able to uh, uh, flag any of the enthusiasm, and I've read all the uh, reviews of, of, of uh, Lakshmi's work on singing Gandhi, India's uh, uh, singing Gandhi's India, Music and Sonic Nationalism, which was published this very year by Rowley in 2020. Uh, and of course, she's doing, continuing to do more exciting work, which we're looking forward to on the Goodrich products and all the archives that, uh, that, uh, that Lakshmi constantly keeps getting lost in and keeps coming out with these absolute wonderful nuggets of books which come out uh, uh, at, at probably even faster pace than before. So Lakshmi, it's such a, such a pleasure to welcome you back here uh, to a conference, which in some ways is also a tribute uh, from Jamia to your, uh, your initial uh, you know, seat that you sought for everybody and kind of brought all of us together. So thank you so much and welcome uh, Lakshmi to this conference. Would you? Yeah, well, thank you very, very much to me for that really gracious introduction. I think, uh, first of all, if I'm audible, I might just uh, switch off my video for better bandwidth because it's a little precarious mm. on my end. Do let me know if I'm audible and then I'll carry on. Um, okay. If I am audible, then that's fine. I shall just start. Uh, I do want to, yeah, okay. I did want to thank Simi for that really gracious introduction. If Simi thinks that um, my little work that I did in Jamia, and in fact, initiating one of the first Indian Ocean Studies conferences with Isabel and Sarah, uh, when Mushir was there, who gave me all the support that I needed, for me, I think my presence and participation today is really a tribute to Mushir. It's somebody I miss, it's someone I miss deeply, and so. I'd like to really sort of dedicate whatever I do today to the memory of Mushir. Um, I also want to thank the organizers, Nishat, for pushing me to accepting this. Uh, it's been a busy time of the year for me and I am really kind of hard pressed for time, but I'm delighted that I was able to say yes. I'm delighted that she pushed me to saying yes and absolutely delighted to see Dilip and Isabel in today's meeting, old friends, um, and Isabel's work, whom I have followed with great admiration and appreciation over the years. So thank you all. So I'm going to uh, remove myself from the video and um, present my paper. If at any point it gets choppy or distorted, there is a backup, which I hope the organizers of the conference can then um, sort of play back as a backup. Yes, okay, sure. my, uh, yeah, my paper is... Uh, titled Towards a Cosmopolitan History of the Indian Ocean, Revisiting Historiography. Um, hard act to follow after Isabel's brilliant, comprehensive, exhaustive lecture. This, uh, true to my form as a practitioner of history, will be much more limited. We'll constantly talk about the problems of inhabiting categories that I'd love to work with and giving flesh to imagination that I'd love to indulge in. Encountering the ocean, especially the Indian Ocean for a historian grounded in South Asia, is a singularly daunting task. For too long, we have closely followed the rise and fall of empires, tracked social and political processes from our understanding of land-based relationships, treating the waters, lapping the contours of the subcontinent as merely a redundant geophysical feature that had little bearing on our social and economic lives. Of course, we were always reminded of the fact that while all the major migrations, invasions in the pre-modern era into India came from land, from the mountains, it was only the British who entered India through the seas and brought the subcontinent under a very different yoke of rule and subordination. So in a sense, this underscored our maritime weakness and vulnerability, and whether we accept that or not, or colonial time is important, the fact was that the impact of empire was deep and transformative, not least of all the ways in which it reinforced certain biases in history writing, especially the indifference to the maritime and literal dimensions of India's historical experience. Predictably, therefore, a whole generation of post-colonial historians from the 50s and 60s 
set about redressing the Eurocentric bias of Indian historical writing, especially its maritime history, the legacy of which we continue to draw upon even today. My concerns here are not to simply reinvoke the seminal contributions of scholars like Ashin Das Gupta or Michael Pearson, of Charles Boxer and Holden Farber, or Om Prakash or Arasaratnam, but to actually go beyond these, to map the more recent developments that have characterized Indian Ocean historiography from the late 90s onwards, and to try and consider a range of analytical categories for a more innovative approach. I shall therefore try and engage with the work of new and younger scholars in the field of connected histories of the Indian Ocean, as well as with the insights that literary and cultural studies have brought to the table and think aloud with you about the potential and possibilities of new categories, new methodologies and questions. From around 1990s, the amplification of the idea of literal society and of connected histories lay at the core of substantial historical research on the Indian Ocean. Pearson's work helped us to think through the idea of social and spatial construction in relation to the literal, which helped us look at economic and political processes through the lens of hybridization, permeability, porousness, categories that have actually been expanded empirically by work in the field of history and cultural studies on the Indian Ocean. Pearson suggested that scholars had remained attached for far too long to land-based frameworks, especially in relation to property, occupation, law, sovereignty, and power. And was, it was only with the foregrounding of the literal as a space that lay in between that we could engage with ideas such as permeability, mobility, hybridity, to better understand an array of social experiences lived. His 2006 essay, Literal Society, The Concept and Problems, said how the mixture of terrestrial and maritime influences made literal society a useful category for understanding maritime history, for the literal that land-based power literally met its limits while it was precisely here that the waves crashed, making it a unique location. The space threw up and supported a variety of social groups who lived off the sea, maintained very distinct modalities of interaction with the hinterland, left their families, especially women, to manage the household elsewhere. The literal communities participated in flexible religious beliefs and partook of shared linguistic practices that gave them certain cosmopolitan elements not easy to explain from a terrestrial perspective where cosmopolitan really doubled up for some kind of exalted elite experience. This arose largely out of the permeability that literal social structures enjoyed, nourished, and that was manifested in mixed religious and language practices in certain forms of mobility and movement that access to certain kinds of sailing and knowledge about the sea ensured. The concept of literal society came in really useful when exploring those voices that were not always captured in conventional archives particularly to understand what Glasgow scholars have talked about as salty subaltern voices that were rarely heard to excavate the deep structures of literal society, wherein new forms of social interaction and articulations of politics of a range of actors was played out. These could be Islamic scholars, small rulers, petty market agents, pirates, operating in liminal spaces, such as gray markets, coastal hamlets, territorial seas. My own work on piracy in India's Western literal in the latter decades of the 18th and first quarter of the 19th century drew from literal society and forced me to engage much more pre proactively with very diverse kinds of moral economy where the terms of analysis could not be anchored in land. Here, coastal groups negotiated very unusual relationships.
relationships with local bosses, with small shrines, gray markets, in order to eke out their livelihoods and articulate a very distinct form of politics that subsumed raiding and predation. Here was a space where conventional understanding of imperial law and jurisdiction, Mughal, Maratha, or British, or caste, lineage, class structures and relations did not quite correspond to actual lived experiences. On the contrary, the idea of nested rights, of custom, muluk sharista, mulka shastra, translocal and transregional affiliations articulated through informal agreements, personal undertakings, local religious elders, small shrines made much more sense. I do therefore believe that we need to not simply hope for an alternative archive, which is what historians are obsessed with, but to actually work out a new lexicon of analytical categories to excavate a literal history of the Indian Ocean. In fact, the history of myriad literals that work around a different logic of economic and social linkages and adopt distinct optics to understand and participate in diverse forms of activity. It's really here that I think the kind of insights that we got from the initiative in Whitwater's Run, sponsored by Isabel and then pursued so actively by Dilip, Dilip can actually help us probably expand the remit of the historical discipline. Patricia Risso, in an earlier work, made this point of lexicon quite effectively when she argued that to adopt a blanket umbrella term like piracy, for example, in the Indian Ocean region was very confusing. In fact, indigenous vocabularies for any kind of aggression or theft did not quite subsume the same nuances that piracy had. And so we did not have a matching word for piracy, we had other words. So how would we then understand those activities if looked at from an entirely different lexicon of vocabulary? Just as custom appeared more appropriate for understanding the dynamics of literal society, especially in relation to fluid social relations between marginal people, local bosses, lower status groups, we could consider cosmopolitanism as a convenient category in understanding regimes in the Indian Ocean. Both peoples in the sea traveling as it were and in the regions they struck roots. <clears throat> It's interesting to note that cosmopolitanism in relation to Indian Ocean histories um, has largely been used to examine and contextualize the workings of diaspora, merchant networks, circulation regimes of elite publicists who formed an extended transnational public sphere in the first half of the 20th century. I'm thinking of work of Mark Ravinder Frost. I'm thinking of very important work that actually came out edited by Isabel and Pamela. Cosmopolitanism also featured very prominently in literary perspectives. And here, the experiences of global community of labor, Laskar, Sarang, Seaman, surfaced to make for a diversity that only an oceanic space could encompass. As Amitav Ghosh put it so eloquently, it's common nowadays to hear diversity being spoken of as though it was some thrilling new invention. But it's unlikely that there were ever any more diverse collection of people, albeit only men, than the crews of merchant ships in the age of sail. Not that the motley collection of men found their diversity particularly useful as a bargaining chip, but for us, their experiences are resistant to being categorized under one box. So to what extent does the idea of cosmopolitanism help in explaining the responses and experiences of maritime labor, of other important dialogic conversations like the kind of work Seema Alavi has done, I think is something that we need to stay with more carefully and more critically. What does then cosmopolitanism yield in terms of insight? Can we see this in terms of actual consumption practice, of a different articulation of rights, of skill accumulation that make communities, some communities, better cross-cultural workers, 
And if so, how do we deploy the category later on to situate political developments in the making of modern empires and in the making of modern post-colonial states? Taking the cue from connected and integrated histories, particularly Sanjay Subramaniam, Scott Levi, particularly Scott's work on Central Asia, which of course is a, a landmass, but very important conceptually. Recent work by younger scholars has looked at the workings of trade networks like the Armenians to make a very strong case for a hybrid cosmo vernacular cosmopolitanism that merged crucial elements from traditional legal and religious practices with new conventions drawn from British law to play a key role in the staging of the British Empire. In this case, and I'm thinking of work like uh, Shantanu Sengupta, who's just completed a very good thesis on the Armenians, cosmopolitanism in this case involved the ability to harness and circulate information across complex conduits and showed up an ability to negotiate with a variety of political regimes and ideologies of rule. Anchored within their own legal traditions and conventions of centralized capital and trust, you centralized trust, the Armenians played out their role as cosmopolitan cross-cultural brokers that enable them to encounter empires and to define their own understanding of nationalism. We also have the exemplary work of Fahad Bishara, whom I shall listen to with great interest, uh, who investigates the plurality of legal instruments to operationalize contracts and thus gesture to a language of plural transactions in the Indian Ocean and to a cosmopolitan phase of Islam in the oceanic spaces. From this corpus of work, the most significant takeaway would be to parse the idea of cosmopolitanism. Did merchants live in a global space or were they in, rooted in their local spaces? I think to answer these questions, we would require to arrive at a lexicon of conventions, usages, ideas, and constructions that would belong to a world of the sea and not of land and its own terrestrial imperatives of revenue, hierarchy, and subordination. It's a question I think is very useful to ask continuously and may hold the key to understanding circulation and porousness as conceptual categories, and then subsequently populating them with empirical material. I think here we really could take our cue from Africanists who have profitably developed the idea of the cosmopolitan to index a very different story of community and space. I'm thinking especially of Swahili cosmopolitanism, which I've read a little bit, wherein aesthetics, material practices, urbanism, though not exclusively as Kai Kress argues, created a distinct identity, making Swahili participants in an Indian Ocean world. We could well consider a taxonomy of cosmopolitan subregions and literals that would foreground material experiences that demonstrated a degree of openness and adaptivity. For this, we may have to undertake the kind of ethnography that Kai Kress did for Mombasa, or to expand the work that Simpson did for the Badalas of Kutch. It's then that we could fruitfully initiate a new shift in Indian Ocean studies that can help us amplify new categories of analysis and to develop the potential of cosmopolitanism as a resource in the making of an Indian Ocean culture. A lot of the painstaking work done by a generation of scholars has given us an arsenal of facts about connections and commodities, and it now rests on future work and reflection to conceptualize anew the arena of Indian Ocean studies drawing from interdisciplinary possibilities. I believe that today's seminar will probably constitute a major moment in the defining of future agendas of research. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lakshmi, for that very, very, uh, you know, I mean, uh, absolutely your style of lecture, absolutely brilliant. I mean, so, so, so important uh, what you've said. Uh, I think uh, Lakshmi has quite rightly alerted us to, uh, of course, the importance of the literal society and our own work. I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with her own work. 
uh, in that sense, of course, uh, she's alerted us to the uh, to the often neglected maritime and literal dimensions, uh, which uh, which at least in the early uh, you know articulations and studies of interactions would often get overlooked, but no longer, uh, as we know, because of the kind of work which uh, should the people that she's named, and of course, people who are here like Isabel and, uh, and uh, uh, Dilip and Lakshmi herself, who've, who've taken up these works. But I think uh, some of the category that she herself has introduced uh, us to, and the category that she herself has uh, kind of pointed out to, like the salty subaltern voices, uh, that she talked about, uh, which can be, you know, which can help us look at new forms of social interactions in the Indian Ocean uh, and look at connected histories of the Indian Ocean uh, uh, are, of course, very, very important uh, directions in which research probably needs to be undertaken. Uh, and of course, she's talked about uh, how we need to probably not really look for a newer archive, uh, really, in that sense, because much of these archives actually exist and much of this, these facts actually have been already uh, talked about by many scholars in the field. Uh, but she's also alerting us to the fact that we need to develop a new lexicon, a new, uh, we need to adopt distinct uh, vocabulary, uh, a new lexicon, which we need to probably, uh, uh, you know, adopt to be, and, and I suppose in some ways her talk already, and since she did talk uh, majorly about cosmopolitanism, already kind of talks to Isabel's ideas, because Isabel, of course, did not really sp speak so much at length about uh, cosmopolitanism, but certainly about cre creolization, and then some of the questions which were, of course, posed uh, do ask us, uh, do do kind of push us to think about uh, not just cosmopolitanism, but let's say what uh, Sela Ben Habib kind of alerts us to the idea of the cosmopolitical. Uh, and I think uh, Lakshmi's um, impulse is really uh, towards that direction of looking at the cosmopolitical uh, formations that take place in the Indian Ocean. So I think that's a, a very, very important uh, aspect that she's alerted us to. Uh, very importantly, she's already kind of given us archives that one can look at in naming the Armenian uh, uh, cosmopolitical cross-cultural, uh, you know, relations, or even, I mean, and of course, one does not really already want to preempt uh, Fahad uh, Bishara's talk, but I'm sure we're going to look at, you know, uh, his take on the plural, plural transaction which takes place in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but she's already talked to us about certain other kinds of versions which might be available, like Swahili uh, cosmopolitanism. So, of course, these are some of the registers which she's touched upon, and I'm sure uh, there'll be lots of questions um, uh, to for Lakshmi, uh, and there'll be a lot of uh, directions that many people will want to seek. Uh, but I think uh, the bottom line of what she said, which is that we need to amplify new categories of analysis more than uh, looking for newer archives, because these archives actually do exist. We don't really need to invent these archives, these, uh, these archives, but uh, to make those kind of connections to those archives is precisely what uh, scholars need. And I think this particular co conference already is pushing us in that direction in the categories that uh, Isabel herself has thrown up and of course what Lakshmi herself has kind of hinted at. Uh, so um, thank you so much Lakshmi for, for that very, very uh, important intervention. Uh, and I'm sure there'd be lots of questions uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the rapporteurs can help us uh, go through those uh, and we can have responses uh, from Lakshmi on the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lakshmi Subramaniam. Thank you for this lucid presentation on lexicon and the need to, you know, engage with it more. Uh, there's a question from Professor Nishad Heather. How do we subvert the old disciplinary boundaries as well as Orientalist views of the Indian Ocean Sphere? Uh, Professor Lakshmi, are you there? Um, can I respond now? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can yes, you hear me? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, can I can I respond now or should I take a range of questions? I mean, it's no. up to you to tell Ma'am, you me. can respond no. now. Ma'am, respond. you can respond. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Simi, for actually um, sort of succinctly putting forth my concerns, which is uh, both to think through um, archives, not necessarily just hunt for new ones. We may or may not get them, but also to uh, approach existing archives with new questions. And the suggestion, therefore, was that for far too long, we tend to extrapolate from our understanding of land and go with the same categories to the archive and then are, of course, disheartened. And then there is that limit of the archive. It's partly to do with the limit of both the concept and the imagination. So I think that was a point I did want to say, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that you foregrounded that. I think uh, Nishad's question is very important. I think we've always had a particular way in the particular way in which um, the, Indian, the history of the Indian Ocean has been described. And I don't want to go as far as the Orientalists to think about the divide 
between the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, for instance. Even the most recent journal of American studies had an entire volume on the oceans of the world, but the Indian Ocean was omitted. So clearly there is a way in which the Indian Ocean is seen as a space, which somehow is kind of subordinated and which somehow is seen therefore through the optics of empire. I think it's only been in the last 15, 20, 30 years that we've actually managed to develop a substantial historiography of the Indian Ocean, which has enabled us to question older perceptions of the empire, of the diaspora, of communities and of nations. And I therefore think a lot of that disciplinary boundary that has existed is being dissolved. So that would be my uh, very quick response to what Nishat asked. Should I look at the chat box and uh, look at um, uh, no, look at the questions? Asked, oh, okay, you can ask. Okay, fine. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a question from Professor Fahad Bishara. Much of the newer literature on East Africa points to the ways in which actors there coded difference through various racial idioms and fought over rights to various privileges, taking. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I just missed the question, I guess. Uh, just a minute, ma'am. No problem, Indrani, I'll read the question. So okay. ma'am, the question is, much of the newer literature on East Africa points to the ways in which actors there coded difference through various racial idioms and fought over rights to various privileges. Taking Nile Green's AHR piece into consideration as well, one sees a shift to thinking about difference quote unquote heteropias as opposed to cosmopolitanism. I wonder, what do you make of this shift? Should I answer? Yes. Okay, I, I, I can see. Thank you very much for, her, for a, a really thought provoking question. I, uh, I am not acquainted with the newer literature on East Africa. I am aware of Nile Green Spies, however, and I am quite happy to consider differences in shifts and emphasis. After all, uh, your own work decided uh, to very effectively interrogate the idea of trust and prefer to think about law. I don't want to make too much about cosmopolitanism as the only category for understanding a particular set of shared experiences across sea and land. Um, I would therefore simply see these shifts as very productive ways of pushing the conversation and of giving us analytical categories to think through a very complex network of practices, uh, of contestations and of cooperative uh, you know, actions together. So for me, the shift is important, but whether or not I intend to use this in my own understanding of the shared space of the Indian Ocean for the moment, uh, remains to be seen. Thank you, ma'am. There's a question from Professor Dilip Menon. Uh, just a moment, ma'am. We seem to be getting a lot. Indrani, of... I'll read it. No, 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 wait. Uh, you, wait. you got it? There are actually a number of questions which I can <laughs> read. So if it helps you, I could respond to the questions by looking at the chat box. Is that I all right? Yeah, 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 surely. You know, surely. It'll, 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 it'll just save yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lakshmi, maybe um, I'd suggest that you can take a look at all the questions and maybe respond because there are so many questions. Exactly. Which are I think yeah. it'll save time. I would yeah. like to know what yeah. Isabel had to say because she says she has a question. But before I, I let me just quickly respond to some of the questions. I'll start from uh, bottom up. There's a question from Rukmini who asks about the adequacy of cosmopolitanism as a term to describe the politics of the salty subaltern. I think that's a great question. I'm simply saying that for far too long, I feel that the idea of the cosmopolitan has been restricted to elite practices. And there's a sense of a particular inclusiveness which may break on the ground. I find the idea of a particular set of network of practices, connecting practices that also happen to inhabit the domain of the subaltern. So looking at pirates, for example, my subaltern actors in the literal spaces, you find these men having and forging connections 
both across their immediate space, which would be the Northwestern littoral right down to the coast and extending beyond to Oman and therefore inhabiting a much larger world of shared practices that are subsumed for me under some kind of shared practice. You don't want to call it cosmopolitan, that's fine, but then I don't want to simply call it as subaltern politics, because what would that mean? I do believe that something about the water, something about working in the literal space makes the actor quite different from say the peasants on land. So I do believe I need a category to be able to make sense of these practices on the literal and on the water. Uh, there was an interesting question from Anupama about significant difference, differences in oceanic method. I think uh, that's, a, again, a wonderful question. I need to think about it. You know, this is the problem, though, Anupama. For me, I am absolutely seduced by the ways in which literary scholars and cultural studies are able to use oceanic method or the ways in which Isabel navigated us through, you know, in her paper. When it comes to the historical method, one, whether one likes it or not, I can talk about using historical ethnography. I can say I'm doing some kind of anthropo history, but if I'm sort of stuck in time and I need a particular, uh, an archive, a repository of material to work with, I always find that there is a particular limit that certain kinds of methods, you know, applies on me. It's like a break. I, I want to play with that method. I want to stay with the method, but then I do find myself somehow, um, you know, somehow blocked. And I'm trying to figure a way out of this conundrum. Uh, yeah, Isabel, that's a great question. The ozone back in Indian Ocean Studies. I think really this could be, I've been thinking about Mike for a long time, uh, you know, as I was getting ready with this paper. I think we need to think a lot more carefully about actual um, materiality of the ocean. So whether it's the ozone, whether it's atmosphere, whether it's pressure, whether it's the monsoon, I think we need to flesh these things out much more materially, and then perhaps use these categories to go back to the kind of questions that we want to study. So we could think of the Bay of Bengal as the dreaded sea. And now we could say that this is a construction by hydro, you know, by geographers and hydrologists in the 19th century. This could also be a very different kind of space in the Bay of Bengal, but there is something very material about storms about pressure, about monsoons. And I think we need to get that back into the way in which we do history. Uh, in other words, it means I'm saying something quite old fashioned. I mean, something that the Anal School did of putting back geography, putting back climate back into history. But I think we really need to start doing that much more substantively. And I'm hoping that you know younger scholars here can give us the tips and show us the way. Uh, like, uh, Lakshmi, there's just one more question by Dilip, which is on that the Indian Ocean is a heuristic device. Should we not be studying the histories of the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans together? Abs I could not agree with you more. Um, for that, we need to have the kind of uh, collaborative research team to be put together and really try and map some of the uh, broad themes that press our imagination when we look at, you know, oceans. After all, very long time ago, very, very long time ago, J.H. Parry said, all the oceans of the world are one. And it's we who sort of divided them up, you know, into uh, the Indian and the Atlantic, not to, notwithstanding the fact that all these oceanic systems threw up very interesting subcultures and practices. After all, the Polynesians uh, traveled all over the world. We did not. So I think there are some, uh, there, there is something to be said about specificity, but there is something to be said about looking at the ocean as a heuristic device. And I would agree with you entirely. Good to have you back on video. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm nervous about the bandwidth, that's why. <laughs>
yeah yeah no no but uh, but thank you so much lakshmi and thank i think you. thank uh, you this was a pleasure yeah yeah it was such a pleasure to listen to you uh, it's it's it always brings so much clarity and gives so many ideas all all, it, uh, all all together so thank you so much lakshmi for that very very wonderful uh, you know interaction and now uh, i think stephen can lead us to the next speaker uh, now we'll move on to the next speaker who is fahad bishara and professor dilip menon will be introducing him uh thank you uh so the now we are on to the third speaker we've been led into the field by two veteran scholars and now we have a younger scholar fahad bishara who's been doing remarkable work in uh, our under, uh expanding our understanding not only of empire but of oceanic history as well as sources such as dealing with mercantile records legal records and so on fahad teaches at the university of virginia and primarily worked with the economic and legal history of the indian ocean uh his uh, marvelous book sea of debt opened up the world of the arab and indian settlement and commercialization of east africa and he's currently engaged in uh writing a history from the prow of a dhow to put it uh, briefly it's looking at uh, the records of merchant and dhow families and uh mapping the ocean differently through this uh, engagement with commerce and one of the most profound things about fahad's work is actually thinking about these questions of narration as well as questions of scale you know how do you move from uh, individual families uh, the tra uh, travels and travails of individual journeys to larger histories that don't entirely coincide with histories of empire and nation and all the solid blocks of habit uh that we are used to so over to you fahad and thank you so much we deeply appreciate your being awake at i don't know get some god forsaken hour when usually people are clubbing in the us and here you are doing a talk for us thank you so much thank you thank you dilip uh thank you for the introduction as you can see the the sun is rising here in charlottesville it's uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning and uh and uh, my children will be up in about 4 hours <laughs> so um, i i'll i'll try to i'll try to be as coherent as i possibly can but thank you uh, dilip for inviting me thank you to nishat as well and to the organizers for the conference for the invite for for the invitation uh, i might feel differently about this uh, after my children wake up but for now i am very grateful um It's an honor for me to share this session with Lakshmi and Isabel, both of whom are historians whom I've admired for many years, and whose writings have shaped my own thinking in profound ways. Uh, as Lakshmi said uh, about Isabel, it's a tough act to follow. I have a doubly tough act to follow. I think um, what I'm sharing is uh, some of the new material I'm thinking through these days. Um, and the material that i'm presenting in the paper i submitted i should say are not exactly the same thing uh, in the material in the paper i submitted i spoke about a separate archive that of a basra merchant mohammed al matruk and i'm still interested in matruk's archive but for this particular talk uh, i want to ground us in a different source one that intersects with al matruk's archive but allows me to speak to the themes of the ocean in a bit more of a focused way the source is a logbook uh called the Ruznama uh of Abdul Majid Al Falakawi and Khoda or a dow captain uh from Kuwait actually he's from a small island uh Falaka the island of Falaka off the coast of Kuwait but he worked out of the port city of Kuwait uh Al Falakawi's journeys run or I should say the recorded journeys run from 1920 to the late 1940s uh and it allows us to think through many of the themes that we're talking about today the logbook itself is in many ways the sort of the uh, archetypal genre of circulation in the indian ocean world it is a genre of the dao uh, itself a symbol of circulation in the indian ocean uh, but it is also a form of writing that is produced in the act of circulation a form of writing that itself circulates uh, and in that respect a felakawi's logbook does not fail to deliver Uh, over the course of 26 voyages in the logbook he covers virtually the entire western indian ocean his trips start in kuwait they move up to basra down the persian coast down to india and then back up the arab coast of the persian gulf all the way back up to kuwait he makes several trips to aden and then he engages in several trips several crossings i should say from 
uh, from India to South Arabia, and then some crossings to East Africa as well. And there are lots of other logbooks like these. The Center for Research and Studies on Kuwait edited and published roughly 15 of these from the mid 90s onward. Uh, El Felikawis was one of these, actually it was the first to be published. But I managed to get my hands on the original logbook through the Nahoda son, who had held on to his father's material for many decades. And what caught my attention when I saw the original was all of the stuff that didn't make it into the edited version, all of the marginalia, all of the notes on navigation, all of these notes on contracting. Uh, and even more interesting is how all of these different uh, ideas sort of jostled one another for space in the logbook. We might think of this as a logbook, but also as a traveling notebook. And it's on these notes, this marginalia, that I want to focus my talk today. But first, I'm just going to mention a very brief aside. Uh, there's a curious similarity between the notes in the logbook uh, and those in another notebook, one by the Nahoda uh, Ibrahim bin Mansur al Kharaji, who was uh, another Felakawi, another Nahoda from the island of Felaka, who had uh, migrated there from the Persian island of uh, Kharaj. Uh, and he was Al Felakawi's father in law. So there's a possibility that these notebooks had actually passed from father in law. Uh, down to son-in-law, and then were sort of re-inscribed over the course of many years of, um, of sailing. Uh, anyway, but back to Felikawi, in whose possession the logbook uh, actually ended up. And I want to go to the contracts that I had mentioned. When I first saw the contracts, these contracts uh, that were copied into the logbook, I thought, wow, how, how odd that he would copy down into the logbook itself contracts that he entered into over the course of his voyage. It seems like kind of a strange thing that somebody would do. Um, and then when I looked a little bit more closely, I thought, and how odd that they're all from the same year and from the same month and actually from the same day. Uh, and then when I looked a little bit more closely, I realized that many of them seemed actually kind of generic. They repeated the same names over and over again, Ahmed, Muhammad, Ali, Hassan. Uh, they were all from the same year, like I said, 1924, and many of them were from the same day, 22nd of Muharram, 1924, which is a totally unremarkable day, actually. Nothing special happened on the 22nd of Muharram in, in 1341 Hijri, 1924. It just happened to be uh, the, the date that he chose. And one of them, this is the clue that unravels the whole, in a sense, one of them was actually uh, generic, using the term Fulan bin Fulan, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, uh, as, as one of the counterparties in the logbook. Uh, and so read alone, uh, there's a, enough of a sort of a mystery here to unlock the stuff of uh, micro-historical detective work. With these, we get a breach in the fabric, so to speak. We can think of El Felikawi as our uh, maritime Minocchio, to sort of refer to Carlo Ginzburg's uh, sort of protagonist in the famous Cheese and the Worms. But to really uh, open it up, to really unpack it, we ought to read these forms, these notes in the logbook against the sea of paper that Dao captains like El Felikawi and El Kharaji, whoever the author actually was, generated over the course of the voyage. These included contracts for loading, for taking on mariners, for the sale of goods, notes for the transfer of money, safe conduct passes, all sorts of paper generated uh, through the Dao. So in a sense, what we have here is a series of templates for the entire paper trail of the Dao as it moved around the, the Indian Ocean. And I want to use these to think about circulating forms in an oceanic marketplace. But I also want to think about how these forms constitute themselves, constitute the infrastructure of circulation, how they constitute the documentary infrastructure of circulation on the Dao, but also uh, a conceptual infrastructure for thinking about circulation. And this is critical to understanding it. Uh, to understand what animates this marketplace, to understand circulation itself, I say that we have to join a history of practice with a history of ideas. And getting at this sort of thinking requires us to look into the documents, but also to just look at them, to think of them as genres of this Indian Ocean economy. And to get at this all, uh, to frame it all, I want to revisit an idea that has been floating around, sorry, I didn't even mean that pun. It was uh, floating around the literature for some time. It was totally unintended. The bazaar. Uh, I don't think the idea of the bazaar needs much of an introduction to this particular group. 
Suffice it to say, this, the notion of this bazaar enters into the academic discourse through the writings of Clifford Geertz on the souks of Morocco. Geertz sees the bazaar as a site of intensely local exchanges in which informational asymmetries between buyers and sellers were overcome through the building of personal relationships. For the purposes of our discussion here though, the main referent is of course, Rajat Kantarai's article in 1995, uh, in which he took on Geertz's bazaar and blew it up in a sense to encompass the whole of the Indian Ocean. In a sense, he establishes the bazaar as a site of trans-regional finance, what he called an intermediate zone of finance between global financial capital personified by banks and local economies around the Indian Ocean littoral where those banks would not go. I want to revisit this idea of the bazaar as a site of trans-regional contracting and animate it a little bit more. Rather than gesture towards the money market, I want to think of the bazaar as a site of contracting, a connected series of marketplaces animated by the movement of people, goods, ships, and money. And revisiting the bazaar as a concept might allow us to think about how to write a history of global capitalism from the Indian Ocean. Uh, I might not end up taking us all the way there today, but I think this is what lies ahead on the horizon, so to speak. Rather than thinking about the Indian Ocean as a site of divergences or of capitalisms that never were, we might do better to think about the ways in which people actively engaged with the marketplace around them, to think of global capitalism or to think of capitalism itself as a global co-creation in which Indian Ocean actors were active participants rather than passive recipients which then would allow us to better engage with the forms, genres, and practices that animated the marketplaces of the Indian Ocean world. For obvious reasons, I cannot do all that work here. Writing a history of global capitalism from the bazaar is a much broader undertaking than I can aspire to today. Instead, what I'll focus on is one aspect of this idea, uh, circulation, which is a critical component of the apparatus of capitalism itself, no matter what your sort of theoretical persuasions might be. Circulation, as it turns out, is also one of the principal tropes of oceanic history. We invoke it as a matter of course in our writings and in our teaching. And again, what better symbolizes this Indian Ocean circulation than the Tao itself? But rather than invoke both the Tao and circulation in the abstract, I want to step us, I want to, I want us to step onto the deck of the Tao and to think of circulation in the marketplace, in the bazaar, from the vantage point of the Tao. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, thinking through al Felikawi's notes allows us to get to, to think about the documentary infrastructures and conceptual worlds that animated circulation in the Indian Ocean. Thinking from the standpoint of the logbook allows us to think about what it means to think oceanically about legal imagination and praxis but also to ground concepts like circulation in the very forms that enabled them. Okay, enough wind up. Let's dig in, shall we? But where to start? Well, uh, I wrote a book on debt, and so what better place to start than the simple acknowledgement of debt, which captains like El Kawi used to bind mariners to the Tao. Through debts, usually for a sack of rice advanced to the mariners and their families, Captains bound all sorts of mariners to the trading and pearling dows of the Gulf. Uh, I've written elsewhere about how actors around the Indian Ocean used different debt instruments to create these bonds of obligation, ties that bound creditor and debtor into mutual enterprises. And what we see here is a very visible form of that. Through these bonds of debt, we are able to see in a sense the maritime firm take shape and we can get a sense of the lines between people and property that are drawn on board the Tao. I say lines between people and property because it is through these debt acknowledgement deeds that we see labor being traded between these maritime firms as well. When a season of plenty turns into one of want, mariners are compressed into the value of their debts and sold off into more solvent Tao's and firms. Thinking through credit and debt then, allows us to see the ways in which labor is made and unmade on the deck of the Tao. But the Tao is more than just labor. It involves cargoes as well, of course. And El Felikawi's notes uh, open up a window into this world of loading and unloading cargo. I should say this is the note over here. These two are other um, contracts 
that other captains had entered into. Inscribed into his logbook, again on the top left, um, are a handful of templates for freightage agreements. I'm sorry, I didn't take the time to sit and translate all of these for everybody. It would have been incredibly useful, I know, but it was, uh, would have also been quite labor intensive. Um, so these are contracts in which a nechoda and merchant agreed upon the cargoes being loaded onto the dows and the amounts being paid to transport them. Uh, the ones that I've seen and the ones that we have up here are all for dates from Basra, which are the principal cargoes that El Felikawi and other nahodas carried out of that port. El Felikawi's note on the top left describes how many dates of what variety, uh, the freightage itself, the fee paid for carrying the, the, the dates, the ports that they're going to be taken to. In this case, in, that, in the case of his, his note, the ports of Karachi and the Katirvat Peninsula and includes the phrase to be handed uh, when the goods, the, the freightage is to be handed when the goods reach the port safely and are unloaded and without negligence. And he has the two manifests, the original and copy. And if one is present, the other is nullified. When read alongside actual freight agreements, which we see on the bottom and on the right, we see how durable that form actually is. But we see also something else, something much more interesting. We see lots of different counterparties leaving their imprint on these different documents. We see lots of different hands, lots of different languages. We see stamps, we see signatures. Uh, the two I'm sharing here, the, again, the bottom one and the, the right one are both from Basra, but from different Dutch merchants in Basra. The bottom one is from El Metruk's archive. And the one on the right is from the, uh, the archive of the merchant Yusuf Asagar in Basra. Uh, both are from Basra, from date merchants, and we see appended annotations in Gujarati. Uh, that's because the Nahodas involved in these cases uh, sailed to Basra from Gujarat and captained Kotias, sailing vessels from that region of India. Uh, some of these were Kotias hired by Gujarati merchants there in, in Gujarat and sent up the Gulf. But I've seen just as many examples of Arab merchants in Karachi or Bombay hiring Gujarati Nahodas to sail to Basra and collect dates for them. As you can see, the Arabic notes are much more detailed than the Gujarati annotations. Uh, but that's not, com that's not uncommon. In a lot of these contracts that I've seen from South Arabia, from East Africa, um, these, uh, the, the Gujarati annotation usually uh, very simply summarizes what's going on in the contract and often refers to another set of materials. Um, the Gujarati annotations in this case uh, include the weight of the cargo converted into mounds uh, and the amount charged for freightage. By contrast, the Arabic text specifies the ports that the Nahoda is to sail to and offers a much more specific breakdown of the charges and the cargoes themselves. I wouldn't be surprised, of course, if we saw an equally detailed account of it in the Gujarati Nahoda's papers, if we had them, of course. What's interesting to me here, though, is that we see the interface of two contractual worlds coming together in a single transaction, a coming together of different lexicons, uh, but also systems of annotation and filing, uh, all of which structure the movements of goods from shore to ship. And we see these individuals actively convert from one system of weights and measures to another. And alongside this movement of dates, of course, there moved something else, something uh, referred to in all of these documents, money. Along with every sale of dates or flour or rice or timber or whatever else was being carried on the Dow was a transfer of money. And in El Felikawi's notes are templates for two different financial ta transfers. This El Felikawi's notes, I should say, are on the right. Um, one is for a financial transfer for the immediate payment for goods purchased, and one is for deferred payment for a month. And these were ways in which merchants could transfer money over distances without having to actually carry currency. At the most basic level, these transfers involve three parties, merchant A, say in Basra, merchant B, say in Karachi, and the carrier of the money order, the Nahoda or whoever else, who would carry it from merchant A to merchant B and would get credit in that amount or get cash. And all of these refer to ongoing accounts between merchants. The request to pay out money to the bearer invariably ask the recipient to draw it upon us meaning debited from our mutual accounts. In fact, uh, that is usually the bulk of the message. They greet the recipient, 
and they ask the bear, the, they ask him to pay the bearer a certain amount and ask him to draw upon accounts between him and the sender. If these seem simple compared to the freightage contracts, they are, but it's not because they're unimportant. In fact, these were perhaps the most ubiquitous and important forms in this world of trade. These allow us to see the financial circuitry that underpinned much of the trade in the Western Indian Ocean. And in many ways, they are analogous to the bills of exchange, the powered commercial exchange in Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Atlantic. There are many other forms that I could have gotten into, and even more if I'd gotten into Al Kharaji's notebook, but in the interest of time, I won't. Uh, reading Al Felikawi's different contractual templates together, though, we can get a sense of the different legal forms that punctuated the itinerary of the Tao. We get a sense of what I call the documentary infrastructure of the voyage of circulation itself. That is, they form the contractual circuitry of circulation, shaping the movement of goods around the Indian Ocean. Thinking of circulation necessarily means thinking of the forms that underpin them, the matrices of rights and obligations, the multiple temporalities embedded in them, and the very genres that shape the movement of people and goods and money. But more than that, they, it forces us to come to terms with the ideas that animate these forms. Uh, the fact that we have model documents uh, that are circulating points to a world of circulating knowledge, knowledge on commercial practice on the high seas and around the coasts. What El Felikawi is engaging in, in a sense over here, is legal thinking. Uh, and if El Felikawi chose to inscribe this legal thinking into his logbook, many chose to disseminate this legal knowledge in more conventional forms. Uh, very few of these were on contracting, but again, not all of Felikawi's were either. I'll get back to that in a minute. But uh, for now, over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, Nahodas, like El Felikawi, from around the Gulf produced writing on various aspects of navigation in the Indian Ocean world. They produced sailing manuals. They translated nautical al almanacs. They produced manuals on weighing and valuing pearls and on managing accounts. These were sometimes long form treatises. At other times they were much shorter, 20 to 30 pages long, outlining various principles. Some of us know at least one of the most famous ones of these in world history, the Kitab al-Fawaid, written by the famed Arab navigator Ahmed ibn Majid. For the Nahodas of the 20th century Gulf, though, Ibn Majid was maybe too far in the past. The more immediate reference for them was Isa al-Gitami's Dalil al-Muhtar fi ilm al-Bihar, the perplexed guide to the science of the seas. And there's a lot that I can say about al-Gitami, who's a fascinating guy, a Nahoda who sails at the turn of the 20th century and a real intellectual. He produced lots and lots of writings like these, he writes in poetry, writes in prose, uh, and he writes across these maritime genres. Uh, but of all of his writings, the Dalil was probably the most famous. Uh, for the Nahodas of the Gulf and the Indian Ocean, the Dalil was a standard reference. Observers of Daos in the early 20th century make reference to the manual and would talk about Nahodas using it. And Al Gatami himself managed, uh, imagined it to be a manual that people would use. He says time and time again in the Dalil and in a shorter manual, the Muhtasar which I have a picture of here, that he wrote it not in the classical Arabic, uh, but in dialect, in a way that his readers would be able to understand. In fact, the Dalil was so popular that another Dao captain from Muscat, or for, sorry, from Sur, from Oman, uh, wrote a manual in response to it, the Ma'dan al-Asrar fi al-Bihar, which he completed in 1952. Uh, it was never published though, it only recently published as part of a UNESCO project. Um, my interest in these isn't just that these are vernacular writings by Dao captains. Okay, that's a lot of my interest in them, is that they are vernacular writings by Dao captains, which I find absolutely fascinating. But principally, I'm actually interested in the, the thinking, uh, in thinking of these genres uh, as generating conceptual frameworks for us to understand circulation of movement around the Indian Ocean world. And here I'm thinking of the provocations of uh, Professor Menon to think through concepts from the Global South, one of your uh, one of your earlier provocations. In part, what I'm gesturing towards here is a history of ideas coming out of the sea of texts that move alongside the Tao. 
If the contracts I pointed to earlier form the documentary infrastructure of circulation, we might think of these as the conceptual universe that animates it. But what do these matter for El Felakawi and his writing? Did he even read them? Well, as it turns out, he did. Alongside his notes on contracting were notes on navigation. In fact, there are more notes on navigation in the logbook than there were notes on contracting. Uh, some of these actively reference other authors like Al Ghatami, like Ahmed ibn Majid, even, whose uh, sort of different maxims on navigation Al Ghatami or Al Felikawi copies down into his notebook. Um, others uh, seem to take from other writers without reference to whom they might be. And rather than thinking of these as just sort of functional notes on navigation, we might understand them as the conceptual universe within which this kind of movement takes place. And so we might think of El Felikawi as actively reading, actively consuming these texts, rendering that knowledge portable. I wasn't joking then when I referred to him as the maritime Minocchio. Like the protagonist in Ginsburg's Cheese in the Worms, El Felikawi is reading and processing and actively joining this conceptual world into his own material reality. In a sense, these are part of his itinerary, the itinerary of the Tao around the Indian Ocean. These ideas form part of the infrastructure of circulation in the Indian Ocean world. They don't exist in the abstract ether of intellectual history. They're actively engaged with and inscribed into the journey itself. We might read them together with the contracts then to think of the ways in which knowledge itself circulated between different Tao captains and across generations, if we think of the relationship between Al Kharaji and Al Felikawi, for example. Through a combination of manuals, models, and practice, we see navigational thinking and commercial legal practice move around the Indian Ocean world. Both of these point to shared conventions, but also a shared history of ideas that are generated on board the Tao and around the marketplaces of the Indian Ocean. OK, so far, I've given you a picture into a world of circulation of ideas, of contracts. But where is the state? And where is empire, specifically? And this is a question that I'm still trying to grapple with. At times, it feels like empire is totally missing from these genres of writing. When one reads al Ghitami's writings on navigation, for example, or looks into Felikawi's notes, it's hard to see where empire is. But in a sense, empire is all over the place here. These forms all intersect with imperial institutions. Uh, these are entangled forms, and I'll get to how they're entangled forms. Uh, there's no need to sort of reify some sort of sealed off vernacular here. Uh, and I share this image with you because it's, it's so striking, the ways in which one uh, or the, the artist portrays uh, two separate sort of vistas, the, the world of the Tao and that of the, uh, the naval cruiser on which he is, from which he is uh, sketching the scene out from. Um, the, some of the people sort of poring over the papers on the Tao uh, as though they were somehow illegible, as though they belonged to a different world. When in fact, when one reads these papers on the Tao, we see that actually they're entangled in colonial knowledge in all sorts of different ways. And to get at this, let me get into the logbook just a little bit more. Uh, the bulk of the logbook, as one might imagine, consists of daily entries recorded over the course of the journeys. And the majority are, are actually very, very dull. Uh, mundane observations on wind and waves, some sort of locational data. It's only once in a while that we read anything that is even remotely exciting. But it's actually in its very mundanity and the very routine nature of writing that we can begin to see what the rhythms of that voyage look like because life on board the Tao meant reckoning with a number of different temporalities. Indeed, it's telling that the Nakhodas chose to call their logbooks Ruznamas, a term that Arabic speakers also used to refer to ordinary calendars. For the Ruznama itself was both a map of time and space. Like any logbook, each entry corresponds with a day uh, and invariably marked a position in one sort of space or another either a point on the coast or a coordinate on the open seas. On the face of it then, the Ruznama appears to be the simple plotting of a voyage along linear time. But as Nahodas plotted their movements around the Indian Ocean, they often actually used three different timelines. 
there was the Gregorian calendar, the Hijri calendar, and the Nehruz calendar. Uh, of course, each varied slightly. The Hijri is a lunar calendar, and so shifts vis-a-vis -vis the Gregorian by 11 days or so every year, running 354 days a year. Um, the Nehruz calendar, however, is a solar calendar, starting with Nehruz, uh, the Iranian New Year, and runs 365 days. There's no, there are no months, it's just a running total of days. Uh, the difference is, of course, that it doesn't take into account the quarter day per year shortfall, which in the Gregorian calendar is adjusted with a leap year. And so in theory, it would slip by 25 days every century, but in practice is, of course, adjusted ad hoc every year. And so why would we have these two, the Nauru's calendar, then the Hijri calendar, and also the Gregorian calendar? And uh, to understand that, we think we have to think of the rhythms of life on the Tao. We might think of the Nehru's calendar as, say, the time of nature, which is regular and reoccurring. Uh, at some level, too, it is almost infinite. It is the time of nature, of the winds, and of the stars, which themselves are part of the journey. Stars are used to plot directions. Stars are used to plot, um, to plot courses across the water. But the Nehru's is also the time of agricultural cycles, of the harvests that the captains sort of depend on to, to lend regularity to the voyage. But then what do we make of the, Gregor the Gregorian calendar, which uh, the captain here, which is Felicauli, refers to as the English calendar, which he uses the term Ingrisi, the Ingrisi calendar. Well, we might think of that as forming the temporalities of empire. Because in the 19th and 20th century Indian Ocean world, uh, the, this world of the Tao was one that witnessed the expansion of the British Empire from its base in India to the shores of Arabia and East Africa. Over time, British officials attempted to craft a transoceanic imperial surveillance regime designed to track, uh, and to track the maritime flows of goods and people in the name of combating piracy, slave trafficking, and smuggling but also aimed at clearing the way for a growing steamship-based transportation economy. Uh, as far as DAOs were concerned, navigating this world of empire meant engaging with graphic artifacts like customs records, which Professor Hoffmeyer has written about in the past, manifests, permits, uh, quarantine documents, receipts, and other manifestations of an imperial bureaucracy. There are many of these that make their way into El uh, logbook, but also his broader archive, his home, which he stored, the, or the archive was stored in a Malabar teak chest, I should say. I'll show you a picture of it in just a minute. Um, but first, let me talk about uh, the most immediately sort of salient one. When uh, captains like El Felikawi lost sight of land, they had to calculate their position based on measurements they took of the sun at noon. In these moments, the logbook entries look a little different. They're not terse statements about wind, water, and coastal location, but they record measurements taken. After listing a series of such measurements, captains like El Felikawi would invariably state that they entered it into the Nuri. Uh, it was only after a lot of asking around that I came to learn that a Nuri was a reference to Nori's nautical tables, uh, which they use to calculate uh, the readings error, that is to record the, or to correct the readings of the declination and angle of the sun, which is crucial to wayfinding, trying to figure out where you are by the sun. If the sun is sort of shifting every day of the year, then you have to be able to, to account for that. And they take Nori's nautical tables, and I should have put up a picture of this, and they actually actively translate all of the entries for every year into Arabic, and they create tables of, of their own. And many of these tables are in El Felikawi's logbook. What's interesting to me, uh, well, I should say, a copy of Nori's nautical tables was in the Malabar teak chest as well. But what's interesting to me is how they incorporate the almanac into their repertoire. This is a text designed to facilitate navigation by British seamen in the service of an expanding British empire. And yet these captains seized onto it and incorporated it into their daily navigational practices on board the Tao. They actively vernacularized it as a Nuri. Uh, immediately, the state destabilizes our notion that there was an Arabic tradition of navigation that is somehow separate from a European one. It suggests that there is at least a degree of entanglement between these traditions. The, the temporal horizons of the Tao and those of empire begin to intertwine more, might, intertwine more than we might have previously thought. 
Put differently, it brings us one step closer to bridging the gap between the Dow and the British naval cruiser that we saw in that illustration a few slides back. But of course, the Nori was just one part of this entanglement. Actually, the very first thing I saw in the teak chest, which is pictured on the top left over here, was a layer of rolled up maps. And since I hadn't actually seen maps that Nahod has used before, uh, I was incredibly excited. And that excitement took on a slightly different hue when I realized that what I was looking at were British Admiralty maps, uh, and that these were annotated in the Nahod's hand. Uh, other observers in the past had noticed this too, that uh, Alan Villiers, the Australian who traveled on board the Kuwaiti down the Indian Ocean in the 1930s, lamented that the great tradition of Arab navigation had been replaced by discarded steamship compasses brought in a junkyard in Bombay and uncorrected out-of-date admiralty charts. Two in minutes, instance, two more minutes. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Uh, in, in, in one instance, Villiers noted that one captain owned a general chart of the Indian Ocean corrected, corrected up to 1746, decorated with Arabic script, giving landmark distances and other information of importance to Arab mariners. And we see uh, examples of it right here. Uh, people like Villiers don't really know what to do about this. They want to see evidence of an Arab science of navigation passed down over centuries and uncontaminated by contact with Europeans. But instead, they see a, sort of, see a form of praxis that had become quite understandably entangled in an imperial system. In purchasing these maps and annotating them and circulating them around the Nahoda community, uh, Nahodas actively domesticated the tools of imperial expansion, weaving them into their own already entangled systems of knowledge. Encounters with the British Empire, then, were not ones in which the two were billiard balls bouncing off into one another, or uh, bouncing off of one another. They were ones in which people bled into one another. Um, and by the, of course, by this time, the British and French empires were only the latest among many in the Indian Ocean. There have been 400 plus years of imperial encounter in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but there's enough to suggest that the historical imagination of Nahodas in the Indian Ocean was capacious enough to accommodate all of these. It's a sense of historical time that can bear that weight. The Gregorian calendar here in Grisi time could just as well have been Farangi time or Farensi time or whatever other kind of time we want it to be. Uh, by contrast, we might think of the Hijri calendar as marking off a temporal horizon of religious calendars, of beads, of other occurrences but also of the marketplace. So then let me go back and finish with the concept I started off with, the bazaar, or was it the Tao? Uh, by now, at least one thing is clear. I've mixed probably too many metaphors. There are bazaars and then there are Tao's and I've moved from one to the other and now I'm trying to move back into whichever one it may have been. But why not instead think of them together to think of the Tao as part of the bazaar? Uh, we might think of the bazaar first as a site of circulation. That much we already know from the work of Rai. Uh, but we might add to that and think of the bazaar as a site of contracting, a site in which goods don't simply move from one marketplace to another, but travel through chains of agreements, of rights, of obligations, of paper. But most critically, we might think of the bazaar as a site of concepts, uh, of active thinking and ideas, all of which are embedded in these different genres of writing. The genres of the maritime bazaar, different genres of writing, first the genres, are, the genres of the maritime bazaar, meaning the forms and transactions that we see in the logbook, but also the maritime genres of the bazaar, meaning the different navigation texts and different manuals produced by Nahodas. Taken together, then we might read the bazaar as a site in which the history of global capitalism is co-created. And the Tao is one site of all of this, and there are many to think through, all of which are connected to one another. Circulation, then, isn't something that we take for granted. It's a deliberate process, one that asks us to stop and read closely and unpack these worlds and the forms and practices, ontologies, and ideas that animate them. And one doesn't have to take the entire maritime bazaar at once. Rather than paint in broad sweeps, we might start small, thinking from one vantage point, one source. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fahad, uh, for uh, dealing with uh, these questions of scale. We began with the Rosnama of al Faila Kavi, and then we moved to global capitalism. And I think there's a wonderful way in which you uh, asked us to think with the idea of the bazaar less as a sighted entity somewhere in a kasbah or in a village or in a city, but thinking about 
moving with uh, Rajat Rai's idea of the Indian Ocean as the bazaar itself, a network of embedded transactions, of contracts, of navigational charts, and so on and so forth. And I think one of the interesting things that uh, your work points to is really how are we to think about the subaltern forms of knowledge and how are we to bring it into the history of global capitalism which deals at some kind of meta level with voyages of discovery and the formation of joint stock companies and so on. And here we are actually looking at the nitty gritty in the ocean in terms of the kinds of details that you speak about, whether it's questions of debt, whether it's questions of contracts, whether it is looking at uh, the, uh, the Nakhoda as being someone who maps the ocean prior to the great voyages of discovery. And this actually gives us another kind of history perhaps for global capitalism where we are very conscious of the great divergence arguments that at some point Europe begins to diverge from Asia. And what you have here possibly is something that I'd like you to think with, the idea of the great convergence that capitalism became possible because of the convergence of these already existing forms of knowledge on the ocean. And I think this is a significant departure that you're proposing, which ties up with the kind of work that Jairus Banerjee has been doing on mercantile capitalism recently, which rethinks the entire history of capitalism as it's constituted, and perhaps maybe bring in the work of the late lamented David Graeber as well, thinking about debt as constitutive of relationships on the ocean. But thank you so much, Fahad, for that wide ranging uh, Ginsbergian account of Phila Kavi and the implications of, for global capitalism. And now over to the rapporteurs. If you wish to take up some of my comments, it's up to you, but uh, over to the rapporteurs for the questions themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for this lovely talk. I must say of circulating knowledges and the bazaar as the contract. There are quite a few questions. So may I begin with the first question? This is addressed by Ahmed. Where do you find the vernacular, the oceanic, and the colonial documentary infrastructures intersect? And what flows and what doesn't across them? This is the first question. Do you want me to give you all the questions together or one by one? I can, I can take them on, um, I suppose. Let's, let's, we can do a few at a time, maybe. OK, OK. So let's answer the first one. I will take up then the next few. Yeah, thank you for the thank you for the question, uh, uh, Ahmed. I you know I I think of um, I suppose uh, thinking of the oceanic for me necessarily means thinking of the vernacular, uh, and so I don't see much of a much of a distinction between the two. Uh, these uh, thinking about what it means to write the history of the Indian Ocean in part means thinking about these vernacular concepts and the infrastructures that they form, and those again. Uh, as I, as I pointed to in the latter half of the presentation, are often entangled with uh, and, and are often very difficult to separate from uh, the imperial ones. Even ones that we might think of, we might try to valorize as vernacular forms. They say, oh, they have a grounding in Islamic law. These are Islamic legal forms. They end up in, say, British courts all the time around the Western Indian Ocean. And so uh, rather than, than try, I mean, for heuristic purposes, it makes sense to say, look, one thing is vernacular and one thing is colonial. There, there are two different lexicons here. There are two different conceptual universes here. But there's a moment in which these are bleeding across one another. And, and it's through these actors that are circulating around these different places and are cognizant of, these, uh, of the institutional landscape of the Indian Ocean who are able to take these transactions between different forms and through different forms and thread, thread the needle, so to speak, that the vernacular becomes the colonial, becomes the vernacular, becomes, uh, so the, they become uh, intertwined with one another. Thank you so much. The next question is from Sritama Chatterjee from the University of Pittsburgh. She has asked, connecting the thread of below the waterline from Professor Hofmeyer's talk, I wonder how the idea of the depth of the ocean, if at all, is present in the nautical manuals. I'm trying to think of a broader question of how nautical manuals can possibly articulate a history of oceanography, thereby bringing literary historiography into conversation with the history of science. Uh, hers is a speculative kind of a question. 
uh, Fahad, may I just interrupt briefly and apologies to Indrani. Fahad, are you able to read the questions in the chat box? I am, I am able to read the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Shall, shall I just go through just and... Read and answer them okay, okay. Uh, and that way you could save so time. I didn't, I yeah, didn't want I to... Uh, the uh, participants uh, are also able to read it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. The, the question, the question of, um, the, it's a, it's an interesting question. The, the, the question of depth, uh, depth of the ocean is actually quite present in these manuals. And Gitami spends a lot of time, uh, sort of locating himself by saying, you will know you are here, uh, because the depth is, and they use the, the term, um, uh, ba, which is a sort of, a a, a leak. Uh, which that's how the the, the uh, use it. Um, so they have they have particular kinds of um, equipment on board the Dow. They can throw it over, and they can then it's like sort of a knotted rope, and they can say, well, how how deep is this? And when you know, if you think you are in this general area, and you know that the water is this deep, then this is how you know that you might be uh, in the vicinity of uh, of Port X. Um, I'm not sure how I bring it into um, conversation with the history of science. This is sort of material I'm, I'm only just beginning to really uh, uh, steep myself in, um, but it's, it's a terrific question. Um, the colonial or the cultural architectural contributions of Nahudas uh, in bazaars, uh, we have the, yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd often wondered about the, the Nahuda mosque in, uh, in Calicut. I'm, I'm not sure what the, I'm, I'm sure there are people here who are much more conversant in that history than I am. Um, but uh, I, as, as far as I know, there are not actually uh, architectural contributions of Nahodas uh, in, in bazaars, uh, so to speak. It's something worth thinking about, though. Uh, some of these are quite long. Nautical manuals we discussed remind me of the. Uh, okay. Um, Sorry, I might need I Dilip, I might need some time to read these. Some of these are quite uh, are quite long. Should I just read them out and it's then? All right, sir. What's that? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. Um, Pick up potential points and answer. Yes. Probably. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm going to have to get back to to at least one of these. Um, Rukmini. Uh, the, how far did the world of the Dao contracts, infrastructures, and sailor manuals conform to injuncts, precepts of major Islamic legal schools, especially the Shafi'i, uh, the Shafi'i Madhab? This is a question that um, that that's been on my mind for some time now, actually, and uh, it's it's a it's a difficult thing to say. Um, uh, it's it's something that I grappled with uh, in in the, my my earlier book, and part part of what I'm I'm coming to now, at least. Is to try to think of these as actually separate, uh, separate conceptual worlds in a sense, um, it to, or rather than rather than thinking of, of the Nahoda practices as somehow having to conform to what we see uh, in the manuals of Islamic jurisprudence, to think of these as forms of legal practice, to think of Islamic law as being this kind of practice. And the sort of back and forth that we see between the Nahodas, the Qadis, the scribes, different legal actors, as forming the quote unquote legal, uh, and it's only in the in the uh, in the context of a particular say like courtroom or a particular court case that if you want to make a place that the, the case that this is a recognized legitimate form of contracting, um, that you might want to draw in all of these juristic discourses. For the most part, though, the material that we have suggests that these Nahodas actually have their own courts, um, they have their own tribunals, uh, and that these are forms that are all recognized in, uh, in their own tribunals, even though some of them at least uh, ostensibly appear to, uh, to uh, adhere to what we might see uh, in, uh, in Islamic jurisprudence. Um, Nidhi, uh, do these... Uh, okay, navigational manuals in Arabic, do these move across the ocean? Are they translated into Gujarati or other vernacular? Uh, I'm not sure about the navigation manuals, but I will say this. I know for, for a fact um, that uh, the, uh, there, there is a specific genre of um, a specific, a specific sort of manual, the chow, man, the chow manual, they call it. And it's for the sort of the measuring and valuation of pearls. Uh, so how do you, in a sense, how do you like determine the carat value of a pearl? Like what's the, the carat value of a pearl, uh, the chow? 
Uh, and that Cho value, we have it in Arabic, we have it in Persian, and we have it in Gujarati. And actually, we have lots of these uh, manuals that are in both Arabic and Gujarati that move back and forth between them. So I'm not sure if one, if one can make the claim that these are being translated, uh, uh, but, but they're certainly formed at the interstices of all of these, uh, these different uh, vernaculars. Um, and uh, logbooks were very much rich in, in code, uh, especially to avoid state surveillance. Is this part of the narrative in parts of the Gulf? No, I, I've, not, I've not heard that. Uh, not that they were, I've never heard that they were written in code. Uh, and, and actually, I mean, for, for the most part, uh, you know, these are, these are uh, very, very straightforward, especially the log of the journey itself. It's, it's, it's actually quite boring to read. Um, the one one needs to to sort of have some familiarity with the nautical Arabic to be able to understand it, but that's only from the perspective of a 21st century reader. Somebody reading in the late 19th or early 20th century wouldn't have had that much of a difficulty with it. And certainly, if somebody like Al Qatami who is writing, he is writing with the knowledge that that there's a, a wide audience out there that would be able to understand um, understand that the language that he's writing in, the dialect that he's writing in. Um, Another, another question of, of the Nahoda Masjid. I need to visit this Nahoda Masjid, apparently. Uh, but uh, no, thank you. There, these, there is, um, okay, can we talk more about the cargo itself? Ship documents like manifests take shape around objects, giving the prominence of object-oriented approaches and the ideas of vibrant matter. Wonder if you've had any thoughts about the agency uh, of objects. This is a terrific question. It's a very Isabel Hoffmeyer question, and uh, and I am uh, wholly unprepared to answer it in any way that is uh, satisfactory. Uh, I will say that um, I think of these papers. When I think of these papers, I think of the papers as objects. I don't think of the papers simply as some sort of window into the past. I think of the ways in which people people. Draw, draw up these papers in particular moments, make claims about papers, fight over paper, uh, and the ways in which papers circulate uh, around, uh, around these sorts of things. And to think of this world of paper being spun around a particular object, the date itself is the sort of the central cargo here. And this whole world of weights and measures and papers and money is really meant to facilitate the movement of the date from the shores of Basra, from southern Iraq, from the plantation, onto the deck of the Dow and into the marketplaces of India. And there's a lot of work that is being done in trying to sort of think through how to translate it across these different contractual and accounting regimes. Um, and then the last question uh, from, uh, from Gina, uh, the evidence that there might've been different forms of money that mattered to ship captains, uh, Paper money that appeared where workers paid with a different form of money. Yes, yeah, this is this is actually quite quite critical. Nobody, you know, none of these workers are being paid in money. Nobody's being or nobody's being paid in in currency. I should say, uh, there's very very little currency that's going around this world. Um, there, the workers are being paid in rice and sugar, bags of rice and sugar, essentially. That if they want to be able to convert into something that looks like currency or looks like credit they have to hawk it around the bazaar themselves. Uh, and so, um, and even when, when people are transferring or making money transfers to one another, there's no actual money being transferred. There is um, there's a lot of book debt uh, and we have account ledgers. And I, you know, I, I think that there's a whole uh, project to be lit written about accounting and account ledgers in the Indian Ocean. We have these account ledgers and just thinking of the genre form of the account ledger itself opens up vistas to a whole world of concepts and a whole world of thinking about questions specifically about this, about money and what money looks like. Uh, and, you know, we, and, and Matruk leaves us with, with not in Felikawi, and Matruk, the person I started with, leaves us with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of accounts. Uh, and they all reference currencies and people are trading in currencies as well, but hardly anybody is actually handing off money to, uh, to one another. Thank you, Fahad. Thank you. And we've come to the end of the session. Thank you for that precise, evocative uh, paper and the aplomb with which you handled all the questions, including Isabel's googly, which we have all come to expe expect in the course of our presentations. 
Uh, and thank you all the speakers in this session for keeping to time. It's very important and it's very courteous of all of you to have kept to the exact 30 minutes, 15 minutes uh, session. And now I hand you over to Stephen uh, to tell us what happens next, because I think we have a break coming up. Yes. So uh, first of all, thank you to all the participants and all the speakers. And uh, it was a wonderful session. We have so much to think upon. And of course, we have our bellies to fill in this break time. So uh, our next session is at 3 p.m. Uh, it's from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, there are two speakers in that session, Alec Bohemoth and Ananya Jahanara Kapir. So please join us for those sessions as well. Yes, sir, you have something to say. Yeah, so I'm just going to say, instead of uh, speaking about the local time, I think we have one hour, 15 minutes, right? We rejoin in yeah. one hour. In yeah, 70 we have minutes. We'll rejoin, uh, regardless of what our times are and whichever time zones we are in. Yeah, yeah we have relatively 75 to 80 minutes, right? Yeah. Good. Thanks. So in Indian Standard Time, it's 3 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> so others can convert in that. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to everyone for joining the session. Now our Professor Nishad Zedi would end this session with her words. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks to Fahad for keeping awake for such a long time. And uh, now I believe in just three hours, your children will be awake. <laughs> so you can go back to them after taking a rest for a while. Thanks a lot. We really enjoyed all the presentations, right from uh, Professor Isabel's to uh, Lakshmi's. And I'm so glad that Lakshmi could, uh, could make it possible and could be there uh, because there were so many anxieties and worries. So at the end, we had a wonderful session, a wonderful panel, and we look forward to to more. So thank you very much. We meet again at 3 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Yeah. We will be ending the meeting now. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, sir.